Hello, welcome to Scientific Baits podcast, episode two. In this episode, I'm going to be talking to another angler that ails from Stoke-on-Trent, a long-term carp angler, John Leyland. John's been fishing for carp since the early 80s. Uh, he progressed onto waters with bigger fish, I think, in the early 90s. And now, as we stand, John's um, caught some big English fish from the Midlands to 47 pound, I think. Uh, so we're going to have a bit of a chat with John about a few different things. John takes a very keen interest in bait. So we're going to be talking about a few different things that he's done over the years, a few edgies. Uh, so I'll just welcome to the podcast, John. You all right, mate? Hi, Dean. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. No, no, it's a pleasure, mate. Uh, I always like to like to get the, the grassroots anglers on, you know, the people who people haven't heard of who've been pretty successful in their own right, you know, while holding a job down, so... Thought yeah, get you yeah, on, mate, yeah. and I know I know you're interested in bait because we've spoke loads of times over the years about different things with bait and that. Because I know you've played around with the enzymes and stuff and different things. So yeah, yeah. thought I'd get you on, mate. Just hear a little bit about particularly interested in this bag fishing what you're doing, but that's coming later on. So we'll talk a little bit at first, then John, about how you started with the with the carp fishing and where it all happened for you. Well, where it began for me, I mean, obviously, yeah. You have uh, in the introduction that I'm from Stoke on Trent. Uh, I'm from the uh, Tunstall end, so uh, my fishing uh, began on Tunstall Park. I mean, I'm 54 now, so I think it was about six when I started fishing. Yeah, uh, but yeah, which was well, safe, I which think was... I was seven, mate. Yeah, I think I was seven when I started. Yeah, I think that was about 1974, stroke 75. Um, um, you know. We're fishing on there, you know, just float fishing with lads from school, uh, etc. And I was actually lucky enough to uh, have, have a have a friend whose dad was a carp angler and his uncle was a carp angler. So, um, you know, towards the sort of the the late seventies, early eighties, uh, I was sort of introduced to uh, obviously carp fishing, but from a bait side of it, they weren't called boilies and they were called specials. Can you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The pastes, yeah. The pastes, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's sort of where, you know, where the interest started. And obviously, uh, while I was sitting there fishing the lake itself, the odd time uh, a carp angler would catch a carp and we'd all go around and have a look at it, you know, and uh, couldn't believe the size of them. I mean, yeah, they're... because... I mean, they, they were still a little bit mythical back then, weren't they? Like, people thought they were rock hard catch and stuff, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, on, on a warm day, on, you know, on Tussle Park, you'd be able to stand, like, one, one end of the lake, one side of the lake, sorry, is it quite elevated. So, you know, if you could stand at the top of there and look down and you, you could see them swimming about and what have you. And uh, they, you know, you know, it wasn't just carp, there was bream on the top as well at the time, you know, some quite decent size beam uh, at that sort of time as well. Um, and yeah, um, and when I'd seen the couple of his carp being caught, uh, I wanted to catch one myself, like so. Yeah. Um, I, think so. That, I think that's how it starts for everyone, mate. Once you see one of them carp, a, a, a decent one, it lights the fire in your belly, doesn't it? Oh, God, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The very first carp, of course, was it was in August uh, 1982. Um, and uh, a mate of mine who was down there at the time, um, I call him Salty. We both know who he is, and he'll yeah. probably listen to it at some point. Um, he was uh, there's a swim by the boathouse. It was like a little wall, and all the cart was swirling. The wind was blowing up that way. It was a dead dull day, and then I was free lining with worms and sweet corn. And I put a rod where these swirls were. And uh, I said to Salty, just, just watch as that, mate, like, and I walked across the hall to go to where I was, where I was, where my kit was. The next thing, Salty shouted at me, and I looked around, and he's bent into this fish <laughs> on the rod. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, he got that in, uh, it was six pounds. Um, and that was it, that was a start, yeah, that was the first one, of course. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, if we fast forward a couple of years, um, you know, we, we were fishing down the park, you know, a few, a few, other, you know, a few mates and what have you. Uh, I'm not sure how, if how people... big were the how big were the fish in Tunstall Park back then, John? <clears throat> oh well, um, in the in the late seventies, I think that there was one, which was about twenty three pounds, um, and um, I saw my mate's dad catch that, 
Um, I can't remember how big when he caught it. How big it was when he caught it. Um, but that fish ended up getting put in bath pool. Right. Um, and, then, and then I don't know how long it lasted in there, but it, it, it did. It wasn't long, and it, it, you know, it was dead like for. Um, but other than that, I think if, say say around about nineteen eighty five, I had a better idea of what was in there. Uh, there's fish to about seventy, eighteen pound in there. Um, yeah, I think yeah. Yeah, well, did, didn't the uh, didn't the Golden Dale Common come from Tunstall Park? <laughs> yeah, it did. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I mean, I, I have spoke to. I mean, you know, Craig. Well, you're big mate of Craig Vernals, aren't you? I think. Yeah, I think. Yeah. I think Craig told me. Um, that he'd caught that fish out of Tunstall Park in the eight, in the eighties at seventeen pound. It may, maybe so. I mean, there was there was um, there was quite a few uh, comments between. I mean, uh, the actual fish when it went into Goldendale. I know I know the year because I know the lad. I'm not going to mention his name. It was late nineties, uh, wasn't it? It was. It was not the late nineties. No, it was. It was about 1993, 94, something like that. What, when it went in Goldendale? When it, went, when it went in Goldendale, yeah. Oh, right. I, I think I was told. I th- I, I, you've yeah, definitely me. Eh? Hey? Definitely. That, yeah? Uh, I mean, no, I'm not, I'm, not dispu- I'm not disputing it, but I think I was told it was... Um, it, well, it could, sorry, mate. It could have been 95. It could have been 95. Yeah, I think I was told it was about 99, but I might be wrong. On, I mean, you were right anyway. You'll know the history of it. Um because I'd never even heard, I'd never even heard of Golden Dale till two thousand and six, I think two thousand and five. Um, but yeah, yeah, it soon uh, it it was a phenomenal fish, wasn't it? In the, in the end, that fish. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Tunstall Park um, in the late eighties uh, was was netted. I think it was February nineteen eighty eight, and a lot of the fish went into Westport Lake. Um, it was. It was we had a lot of rain and there's a lot of pollution and there's a lot of fish dying. And then, and then so the the water authorities or the council made the decision to net it. So it was actually restocked. Um, I think it was 1990. So in terms of that fish, God knows where, you know, it could have come from but the, the latest stock and it could have been in there for years. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it, it lived... I think it died in 2019. I think the last time it got caught, it got caught by an angler using my bait, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. But it was it was a shadow of its former self. It was a shame how it went, that fish, really. I mean, some some of them, you know, it's unusual with carp, isn't it? Because some of them, they'll stay looking pristine and at the same weight until they die, and others just hang on forever, and they just look in a sorry state. It's a bit of a shame when that happens, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean... <laughs> I think Goldendale, really. I mean, I haven't walked around there for years. It must be, it must have been mid to late nineties when I last went. Had a look around there. Um, you know, it seems daft that it been on my doorstep. But uh, to be honest, it didn't, it, the, the carp interested me, and I, and I as it showed a you know, good interest in finding out who caught it and where and etc. But it just wasn't for me. I was by then. I was used to like fishing waters where it's just pure fishing. You, and, uh, you, you were used to a bit of peace and tranquility, John, weren't you? And you didn't want to go yeah. into all that, did you? No, <laughs> no not like uh, idiots screaming around with, I don't know, drinking white light and air rifles. Yeah. I, did, I did loads of stories. So, I mean, uh, I, I didn't do an awful lot of time on Goldendale. I mean, I wish they had it on. Well, I do and I don't because I should have caught that fish, but that's another story. Um, but it was never it was never a place where I enjoyed fishing. I'll be honest with you, I did I did catch a few out of there, and I was very close to catching that big one. But I never enjoyed fishing it because I was the same as you. I'd been used to fishing places where fishing was nice and peaceful, and it was totally yeah, different yeah. on there. Uh, yeah, it's, it's as much about the lake as me as the fish. I mean, there's got to be some nice fish in there, but if I don't like the surroundings, I don't enjoy the fishing. Uh, no, when uh, I knew. In the latter years, the guy who owned it actually had all the trees cut down, didn't he, apparently? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was all against the preservation order, but we won't go into that too much. But yeah. it was it was ruined, wasn't it? It was ruined, but there you go. I still see cars parked up there now and again now when I'm on my way work. Like, you know, the, fi- the fish are doing all right, mate. I mean, you know, when I fished for that big fish in there, um, 
the next biggest fish was probably 23, 24 pound at a push. And they're doing 30s now, they are. So, oh, well, that's fair enough. Then. I mean, for the free water, I mean, I take it it is still free. Well, um, sort of, yeah. I mean, you're technically poaching, I think, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the, the fish, the fish are really, they are top draw, the fish are in there. There's some lovely fish in there, but it's just, it is what it is, and it? it is what it is. Yeah. yeah. After you've been using, used to fishing places like you've progressed on to, Orkston and that, we'll talk about that. Um, you know, fishing somewhere like that, uh, you can't really get two two waters at different ends of the spectrum, can you? No, 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 definitely not. Um, you know, you know, if you if you could like pick Golden Dale up and plant it in a a field in Shropshire with loads of trees around it, and uh, yeah, fair it, enough, but... yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, um, and that's another reason why I've never really, you know, fished Westport Lake either. Um, you know, a lot of my friends have fished down there over the years. You know, and uh, you know, uh, it's it's open to everybody, isn't it? You know, well, that, so, that, that's that's the reason. That that's one of the reasons I've never fished it really, John. It's just too busy with people for me. I don't like that when I go fishing. Yeah, yeah, same me, mate. Um, I mean, saying that, I used to go down there. Parking in the eighties in the winter. Say so come, come. Well, so call it winter. Um, October time. Yeah. I mean, with a few mates, we used to sit it out. You know, try and catch one of the big ones that were in there. I mean, at the time, at the time, in the late eighties, well, mid to late eighties. I don't. I'd, I'd never heard of any twenties coming out. This is park, obviously. Um. Um. I think my mate, uh, Kaza, had had a couple of nineteens. Uh, that's probably like the biggest I did of like, and then after that I didn't even. I mean, I, I don't think I went park fishing after nineteen eighty nine. I've haven't, I haven't, I haven't not even been there doing that since. You know. So, so what year did you start fishing Oak then, John? Oak, Oak Lake and Shropshire. <clears throat> well, the on the obviously as you know yourself, the pioneers. Oak, did you start off on the pioneers? Yeah, I, think, I fished the pioneers at the odd time when somebody could take me. Uh, because before, before I, I didn't have a car proper till. It was 1988. Um, and so before that, I'd, uh, I'd had a ticket. We had to rely on people taking me, like, at the odd time. But um, Yeah, that, that's the so, story of my life, John, because you know I still don't even drive a car, and I'm 48. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, anyway, so, so yeah, I think that 1990, uh, me, me and Craig, we were on the Pioneers nearly every weekend fishing that clay bank. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's the that's the year. I we in Ork then? We in Wem Anglers or we? On no, the no, Pioneers? no. I didn't. I didn't get in Wem until nineteen ninety one. Right. Yeah. So that that's the same time as when I I caught my first double out at Oak Lake on the Pioneers in nineteen ninety when I left school. Uh, and like we spoke about it before, didn't we? When we were chatting, um, yeah. that top end it was just even with carp on it and them reeds. Oh, they loved it. Yeah, like, like yeah, as you, as you're referring to a previous conversation, um, if, for people who don't know that Wem Wem anglers had about the last four four or five swims to the right of the clay bank, didn't they? Yeah, well, I'll just I'll just clarify it for people. We, we're talking about two different lakes here. You've got uh, one lake, Old Lake, which is a big long lake, probably a mile long, and then at the end of it, there's a dam wall, and then there's a smaller lake that's probably about. I think it's about eight eight to ten acres but they were separate lakes but where anglers had like john says the the top two or three hundred yards of of the the pioneers lake so it was always referred to as the pies wasn't it because the club on it yeah. was two pioneers yeah yeah so yeah so um and, and i think it was like I say 1990 uh, me, me and craig were fishing on there uh, nearly, nearly every weekend well nearly, every, just every sunday Every Sunday, we, we did get quite a few rollickings off uh, Mrs. Emmings. <laughs> yeah. Uh, being there too early and off too late. Yeah. Uh, but the other, yeah, we had to get there really early to get the swim. And yet, and had to stay late because it was uh, the old last knockings uh, situation now. Yeah. You could, you could scrape a few fish out. Well, like, always, a good, it always a good time on waters where you can't do a night, mate, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so then... Uh, in 1991, um, I got me, I got a WEM ticket, and then uh, I never even bothered fish on the on the pies after. I think I did one more session, uh, 
on the pies after going and when. Then that was it. Then I was I was down that end. Um, and, and, and back in the day, anybody who was anybody, like 1991, there was a lot. It was packed on the on the on the when. Um, a lot of people on there in the week weekends. I mean, I, I mean how, how big how big were the fish in when in 1990, 1991? Um, it 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 was managing to scrape the thirties. Um, yeah, which were they, they, they? I mean, back then they were really big fish, weren't they? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and also, uh, um, back, back in that sort of era, uh, not too many had gone in out of the pies mm. as well. So you got the. Oh, the, the don't, know, don't, know, don't know if you talk about that, really, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So the, the fish uh, came from the Isle, the Isle of Shrewsbury. Yeah, um, which, which it stopped, it stopped a lot of waters, didn't it, the Isle? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the, people know the strains of the fish, like you know, they've been, that strain of fish in Cheshire, you know, on yeah. certain waters. Yeah, it's, um, it's stocked out of a lot of places, hasn't it, the Isle strain? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, though, anyway, um, yeah, like I say, the, the, the lake, I mean, I was fishing Friday till Sunday uh, in 1991. And... Um, very rarely I could get down the there's like the it's hard to describe people haven't seen the lake before, but there's like bays at either end. I mean like I, long. I, I could I could actually for anyone who's watching on YouTube, I, I could put a picture of Oak Lake on the video on YouTube, which I may well do because I can get a picture of it off Google Earth. So yeah. pe- so people can see um what we're talking about uh, geographically, the shape of the lake and the bays and stuff. So just yeah, it'll yeah. clarify it for people a little bit more. What you're saying? Yeah. Um, so anyway, like 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 I said, the the uh, lake. Yeah, you get there on a Friday. Um, I, I'd get there Friday dinner time, and uh, there'd be no chance of uh, getting down on the first or second bay. Um, it was all it was all stitched up. Um, Anyway, we, we, we were eight, Gary, at the time. Um, we ended up fishing like monastery, the monastery and um, little monastery in the leak, that, that sort of area. And, you know, even the, there's, a, there's a swim called the Pads, which was probably about 200 yards up from the leak. Well, about like 100 yards up from the leak, sorry. You'd never, ever be able to get them than pads. Um, there's a left hand pad, right hand pad swims, and they, they were always occupied. That, them two swims, and then first, second bay. Uh, were the main uh, where you know the the most fancied swims at the time, and so we, 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 we to be fair we didn't really compete not unless we got like uh, annual leave or anything then we could go on there but then it was still the same but it was it was packed twenty four seven seven days a week mainly on the in so was it so was it tough fishing then because it was that pressure um <clears throat> well also it was there in the in the fish meal revolution era as well. Is that when everyone started uh, using fish meals on there then? Well, the, the, most people on the premier. Yeah. Um, I mean, so- I mean, I, I'll just, I'll just intersperse here with a little story. I can remember Brett Bullock saying to me, um, it went through phases on Orc because he said, he said um, there was one phase where, Everyone was using milk protein baits. It might have been before you joined, because I know Brett was in it in the 80s. Um, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. And everyone was using milk protein baits. And then he said, the Tooties came along, the original Rich Reef Tootie Fruities. Now, Brett said to me, this was interesting, when I was chatting to Brett about this. He said, we all started using the Tooties. He said, but you would catch more on the Tooties. He said, but you would catch the bigger fish on the milk protein baits. Yeah, I think they were using yeah. Inuval and stuff. Um, and yeah. he said, he said that he said the Arnival definitely never did as many fish. He said, but it, it would ninety percent of the time, if you caught one on the Arnival, it was a bigger fish, you know. And I've got oh, I've yes. got a lot of theories about milk proteins and stuff um, with bigger fish and older fish. But I thought that was interesting when I spoke to Brett about that because he, he, he's he's been all through the ages on auction because he was there. I mean, I think. I think Brett was in there from about 86 or something, mate. I'll have to ask him, but it was early. Th- it was early. I think it was before that, mate, because um, Brett, Brett and his old man used to be miners, didn't they? Uh, I know his dad was. I don't know if... Brett might have worked down the pit, yeah. Yeah, yeah he did. He did. I know Brett very well. Um, 
And yeah, um, he spent a lot of time on Hawks in the minor strike. So when was that? Uh, eight, 84. Was it 84, Mark? I yeah, think it was eight. Well, Brett's, Brett's only 10 years older than me. Um, so yeah, yeah, that'd be right. Yeah, that'd be right. Because in 84, I'd have been 10. So Brett would have been 20 then. Yeah, I think I think um, I think that's right. Yeah, I mean, I have spoken to to Brett because um, we've had quite a few conversations over the time we spent on the banks together. Because at the time, you know, in the in the early nineties, Brett before he moved off, and I think he moved off. It might have been nineteen ninety three or ninety four. Um, I've got no Brett and his old man pretty well, or oh, very well actually. Um. Mm, mm. um yeah, but the the actual tutties. I mean, that was before my time on there. I used to call them the Shrewsbury Specials. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've heard quite a few stories on that because there's a guy, a very successful angler on there, from the probably from the mid '80s to the early '90s. But but a guy named Paul Ainsworth from Blackpool. Um, he seemed to Blackpool. be Blackpool. Blackpool. Oh, he came all the way down from Blackpool, did he? For sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there, there's a couple of guys who come from about well, three of them who. who in the end, come from Blackpool. Ma- fish mind there. you, John. Mind you, John. It shouldn't really be that surprising because, you know, back then, waters that were doing thirty pounders were still pretty scarce in a lot of areas of the country, weren't they? Oh yeah, they, they, that was probably their nearest waters, apart from uh, probably Patsel. Um, I, know, I know Paul Ainsworth. He he, uh, he fished Patsel. Um, as well at the same well, time. I would say else. I would say, mate, if you lived in Blackpool, Patsel's further than Oak. Yeah, it is just yeah. It's yeah, it's further than all. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So um, in in ninety one, um, we started off using using the. Do you remember Rich with Bird Foods? Yeah, them, yeah. Them ready mates. They did a, they did one mate. I can remember Rich with doing one bird food that was unflavored. Oh, I don't know. Oh. Yeah, they they definitely did one. It was a bird food. And it had no flavour in. You had to put your own flavour on it. All right. Oh, the atomizers. Yeah. Well, no, no. I, I can remember. I can. I can definitely remember uh, that Rich Rift did a bird food bait, and it was unflavoured. So you had to put your own flavour on the bait. Right. I can remember the ones they used to call on the. Oh God, neutrals, didn't they? Yeah, that's they it. Called... That's it. That's that's what I'm talking about. The neutrals. Yeah. They were they were freezer baits, though, weren't they? Though? Yeah, yeah. They were unflavoured, so you yeah. put your own flavour on them. Or your own yeah. liquid, or whatever yeah. you want to do, but it had been a flavor yeah. back then, really. I don't think people, I mean, liquid foods were only really you know, started coming around in the in the early 90s, from what I can remember. Your liquid foods, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, anyway, uh, we started off there using the, the rich earth bear foods and the uh, tiger nuts, and, and to be fair, we, we, we struggled. It, it, we, then uh, what's it? Nutribates. And if you can remember, it's the other bait out called the fish food mix. Yeah, that was their uh, that was their very first fish meal bait. Yeah, and it 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 was horrible to roll. It was re- it was all, it was very very stiff bait. Yeah, and it was hard to get through a roll in that. And then not not so long after that, they, they brought the 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 big fish mix out. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we got onto that, and that was better for roll. And uh, the fish had it as well. As quite a few of us started using that. Yeah, good bait there. Um, good bait there. Yeah. Yeah, mm. so we're, we're you know, if it, I think I spoke to this about, but, sorry, I spoke this about this to you before, about the, the Nutribates catalogues back in the day, where where you made you like fry and leaving anything out. <laughs> so we've got like two or three different Yeah, with all the different additives what they recommended. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So we're, all of them were in the bait. I think, I think the face, the, 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 the flavour you used was Loganberry, I'm sure it was. It's come to things to mind. Uh, sweet Kajowsi, um, two different fish oils, Nutrimino, you know, and uh, greenlet mussel, the, the little did spoon you, of that that came did, in the tub. I was going to say, did you use the, the Nutrimate's greenlet mussel? I did, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. that, that's what I used. And I'll be honest with you, e- even though the recommended dosage was minute, I mean, you used to get a little spoon in it, and, and the little spoon... Yeah. Was the dosage for a six egg mix, and it probably only weighed. I bet. I bet the recommended dosage was something like three grams per six eggs. So you're talking, you're talking there something that's only in at like 03 percent. 
But I'll be totally honest with you. I actually did think it made a difference to the bait. I don't know if you did, but I did think it made a difference. Well, well, I thought you could, you could smell it in the in the finished bait. Yeah, I think you could as well because it was a, it was yeah. a very strong smelling green lap muscle powder, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, like I say, I mean, I mean, did you bit... did you use it at the recommended dosage? Yeah, yeah, it was that deep. I couldn't afford to do any other. Yeah, well, that's it. <laughs> I mean. I mean, I forget how much it was. It, it, it was probably about six quid for that little pot, wasn't it? You know. I can't remember, but when you bought all the stuff together, when you do it when you very first initially start off and you, you buy a couple of bags of base mix, knock a bit of bait together, get it in the freezer, etc. Yeah. And then like for a few weeks, you're all right, aren't you? Then then you've got the old tattle shop again and then a few more weeks yeah. down to replenish your stocks and the uh, I mean, I, yeah. I, I am 100% convinced that that Nutribate's green lip muscle, even at that very low dosage, made a difference. And I'll, t- I'll tell you what, what made me 100% convinced it made a difference. In 1996, me and one of my friends who had met on Wedgwood, Scotty Adams, he used to, he used to be a member of uh, Bromley Mill. You've heard of Bromley Mill, haven't you? Yes, I've heard that, yeah. Yeah, well, he used to be a member at Bromley Mill. And Bromley was like mainly a bream water, but there was carp in there. There was carp in there. So he got me on. He got me on there doing a gas session. And I never forget when it was because it was when Paul Gascoigne scored that brilliant goal against Scotland in Euro 96. And oh, yeah. um, and we were on there and we were fishing pegs right next to one another. We were down the shallows. And, and Scott had told me he reckoned it had done carp to 27. It was a bit all shush like Bromley Mill was. Because you couldn't get on their carp angling, really. It was all bream, bream anglers. And we fished in these swims next to one another, and we were using the same bait, um, premier bait, spice fish mix. He was using different attractors than me, but we were both using the same fish oil. We were both using the uh, Nutramino. And I was putting green lip muscle in my bait, and he wasn't. And he had he only had one fish. And I had a I had one just under 20. And an 18 and a half. And and it was as if the fish just preferred my bait to his because we were that close together. We were that close together. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, yeah. you can only go off what happens, can't you? But we were that cl- I think I lost one as well. I think I lost one, but Scotty only had one. And he'd fished, he'd fished it before. And, and I started thinking in my head then, because I, I was already catching well on that bait. Um and I was catching, I'll be honest with you, I was catching a few more than people who were using the same base mix, but they weren't using that green lip muscle powder. And that was, it started making me think there was something in that that definitely attracted the fish a bit more than the, than the standard yeah. base mix. Yeah, and then also from my memory, and obviously it's a long time ago, that green lip muscle is a lot different than modern day green lip muscle. Totally different, mate. That's why I don't yeah. use it anymore. Well, there's a few reasons why I don't use it anymore. I mean, I can talk about that another time, but I did once. Once I'd done my research and I knew what it was, what was doing the business and green lip muscle, then I realised yeah. thirty quid a kilo for something it wasn't worth the money. But yeah, don't get I me know. wrong, don't get me wrong. Until I knew why it worked, I'd kept using it for a bit. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've I've heard, I've heard you mention it on the uh, with Sam and Pete on the other yeah. podcast about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, so and well, 1991, started catching, um, didn't have many. I can't, I can't, to be honest with you, I think I had about eight or nine fish all year. Um, and that's fishing up until probably end of end of November, that would be. Did you used to jack uh, in for the winter then, like I did? I used to jack in at winter. Well, yeah, um, I, 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 when I was fishing on the Pioneers like the year before, I fished I fished that on the winter. Um I, I used to sneak the odd night on, just go back go up on the wet wem side and sneak across. <laughs> <Some people's laughs> that, but, but um yeah, when, when it comes to sort of November, you get be getting like a lot of frost and stuff and the action had slowed down and nothing's coming out then. I, I just kicked it in the head then and yeah and Maybe went on sort of for, for the last week, but I tell you what, that the, on the back at the back end, I always remember it. Obviously, as we're talking now, what um, was it February nineteen ninety two? Went up there for have a look to, to to see you know, see what was going on, and I'm not kidding you, it was rammed. 
Um, anyway, uh, did, did go on there. And that. Oh, with anglers. Catch, yeah, I didn't catch anything. I mean, um, fe- February February is a, a funny month, isn't it? Because it can be a rock hard month, but he, he does big fish on most waters, doesn't it? February, you know, a lot of water, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of waters will produce a big fish in February, won't they? Yeah, and I mean, there was a lot of, like I say, if you were, were, were rewind back to the summer, all the anglers that were on in the summer seemed to all be back on back on at the back end. And it was just stitched up. So I only went a couple of times in, in yeah, well, February. There, there was a close season then, though, as well, wasn't there, John? Yeah, it finished then. So, I think it was the, obviously the 14th. March, March, the 4th, March. March the 14th. So they'd all be yeah, going on yeah. for a little bit of a fishing fix before they couldn't fish for a few months, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so then um, I joined another syndicate. Well, I joined a syndicate. Back then, that was my first syndicate uh, that I joined with my mate Gary and that. And uh, we went uh, on there, and uh, I mean, it's it, it, for the it, it, it's it's uh, a non publicity now, so I can't, I don't really want to uh, mention the name of the place. What, what, year, know, what year is this, John? Uh, 1992. And actually, actually, I was actually in, in that syndicate in 1991. I forgot that it was 1991 that I first joined the syndicate. Oh, right. Uh, um, think, I'm not sure if I know where you're talking about. I mean, what, what part of the country is this in then, John? Still in the Midlands. Uh, it's, it's in Cheshire, mate. Uh, just just before you get to all sage, you're from Kids Groove. <laughs> I probably I probably named it now, haven't I? <laughs> oh right, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's done publicity because uh, we like hangers have got it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure about the sensitivity of uh, being able to talk about it. Cause yeah, I've, I've got yeah. A... I mean, I th- yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah so, we, uh, we've spoke about that on the phone, but I didn't real—I didn't realise it was non publicity but yeah. Yeah, that, that, we like waters all like that now. Um, so, uh, but if we move on to summer uh, of, of 1992, um, back on auction again, um, it was a different story this year. Uh, we'd set the stall out to, I mean, I was fishing Thursday till Sunday this, that year. And it also coincided with a lot oh, of the, uh, oh, the obsession was kicking in big time by then, was it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I was fishing Thursday till Sunday. Um, so, so was my mate Gary, and uh, luckily, uh, there's been a, a big exodus of anglers. Um, on you know, it reads me it was coming ever more popular. Uh, quite a few of them had gone on there and maybe other places, but it was a lot quieter. In regards to uh, angling pressure, etc. Yeah, well, just not 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 so much angling pressure, but anglers themselves. You know, it wasn't so much stitched up, and we've going on a Thursday helped no end. And uh, so and so, uh, oh, just 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 in, uh, interrupt you there. I mean, at, at this time as well. So it was like a divergent point. Once at this this point in time, people were either going. Towards Shropshire and going on Orc, or they were going on Reedsmere, weren't they? Yeah, they're going on Reedsmere, and there's probably other other waters again. It, it was, I mean, there wasn't that much about in comparison to today. But, no, that's what you know, I mean. So it was like it was like a fork in the road type of situation. Once it's because you because yeah. you'll talk to some people and they went up Cheshire and went on Reedsmere and Cape Stone and that, or or they went down to Orc, didn't they? You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. And so yeah, so it was so it was a lot quieter, and we could sort of do what we wanted to, in, in, in regards to where we wanted to fish, we could have a better, better choice of where we could fish, and uh, that coincided with using another bait as well. Um, the bait we were using then was um, quench from Solar. Oh, the quench mix, yeah, I can remember that yeah. bird food bait, that John. Yeah, yeah, so. So we'd use that on on the syndicate. Um, uh, well, it was a bit of a um, how can I say? <laughs> it was a bit of uh, secrecy on the syndicates because we were actually using tiger nuts and jumbo peanuts, but we used to like leave a bag of quench out so wow, people pe- think we were using boilies. Peanuts, are, <laughs> peanuts are a good bait, mate. I mean, I haven't used yeah, tigers yeah. much, but I know peanuts are a good bait. Well, we used to use both together. Um, you know, just as free offerings, not on the, not on the hair. Uh, we'd either have jump, double jumbo peanut or double tiger, uh, not, not popped up, just lying on the bottom. Um, anyway, so so on on auction like we were using that quench, 
and uh, we were getting in the areas where fish were down in them bays and stuff, and uh, we just started catching from the off. I mean, the, on the, on the quench mix or the on the or the nuts. No, we were using uh, we, we, I, I started off using peanuts, normal peanuts that year. But the the quench the, the quench was catching them. They were uh, we, what we basically what we were doing. So we so that. were you rolling that yourself then? Yeah. What what yeah. was it? What was the recommended the tractor pack for that? Was did you used to get it in a little bottle or you just had it yourself? Oh right. So the tractor package was obviously the base mix, uh, Esther Blend Twelve. Yeah, which which uh, is basically I think I think I've got it on good authority that that was. Um, the same thing as the rich with tutti frutti. That's another it? story, right? Well, that, that's an Esther. That was. That, yeah, I know, but I, I. Well, yeah, I mean, I have got it on good authority that that Esther Blend Twelve was the same attractor as rich with tutti frutti. All oh, right, right, okay. Um, obviously, that's when squid and octopus koi reader first came out, so yeah. we, we got that in. I think it's two mil of uh, Esther Blend, seven mil of squid and octopus. And then what we used to put in there and there was three mil of sweet kajowser. And Oh, so um, you were doing your own twist on it, were you? Yeah, yeah, and uh, multimino. Mm. Um, yeah, well, the multimino is slightly different than the than the uh, neutramino. It's, you know, phosphoralcholamine. But, that, I mean, that's something we could talk about another time. It's, that was like that was like the next stage on from the liquid foods with neutramates. Once they started off with yeah, the, yeah. the the neutramino, which was multi, which was minamino. Um, and then they started with the multimino, yeah, which was called multimino PPC. Um, that was but, yeah, but that yeah was. I mean, I mean, I have got it on good authority that I, I mean, I might be wrong, I, th- I don't think I'm wrong that that Esther Blend 12 was the, um, the same attractor as the um, the rich with tutti frutti. Um, with hold on a minute, right, John. Right, so, um, so I've just mentioned the bait that we were using. Uh, we did, we did start off with, with taking peanuts with us, um, but after a, a couple of sessions, we we just left them out of it because basically what we were doing, we were rolling up a fourteen mil uh, quench with what I've just said, you know, all the bits and bobs that were in it, and there, uh, and. What what came from fishing down them bays is um, there's a lot more fish activity, a lot more to see in terms of where's it? You know, where's all, this down the first and second bay? Yeah, yeah, like that, like, like the fish bubbling, you know, in the mornings and stuff. Um, a lot of in the first bay, a lot of the anglers used to cast right over the far side at the back. Yeah, you know, and. Um, where yeah, whereas you know, we 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 were seeing these bubbles in the morning, and then you know the anglers who were fishing there at the time when we were fishing there, never really got up early as well. Uh, so me me and Gary were up early, um, and we basically sort of fine tuned the angling because there's a lot of bream in there. We were using bottom baits. Uh, it's a, it's an organic silty bottom, if you like. Mm. Um, it yeah, it was a very, it was a very salty lake back then. Money talk. Yeah, yeah, and and so yeah, we were using backleads, which you know now I probably never use a backlead ever again. But back in that sort of era, every you know backleads haven't long been since out, and they're very fashionable. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, I'll, I'll just interrupt you a little bit there. When you're saying you never use a backlead again, I mean. I, I I will only use them in certain situations, but why won't you use them? Because the indication issues. Yeah. Um, over the years of fish using backleads, um, I think I've had two occasions where other anglers, not, not, not I don't think, I know Craig was one of them. And uh, what was the other guy's name? Dave from Liverpool was another. And basically, they come to me and told me they caught a fish on my rod. The fish had kited to the left. You're, you're not fishing that far out. And you're not fishing that far. What apart. do you mean? They've reeled one in and it's one of yours. And you've had you're no, you've had no my indication. Fucking, my rig up. My, I've had no indication. Yeah. Well, that, um, that, that's what I was saying to you about the indication. Because I, 
I I have used bat lads, and I still will use them now in certain situations because I'm I'm hundred percent convinced that if you can hide your line from fish, it helps you. But yeah. at the same at the same time, I can remember catching a fish, mate. Um, I think it was the year two thousand and one, um, when it was foot and mouth when we had that foot and mouth outbreak. Yeah. And I went on Wedgwoods because I wasn't fishing it much then. I, re- I only fished it a lot, really, between 95 and 90, 97. But I went on as soon as that foot and mouth was lifted, uh, the restrictions, because you couldn't fish anywhere because of the restrictions. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. And I went on, mate, and um, I found all the fish. Well, I'll say all of it. A lot of fish up the top end by the dam. And I was rubbing my hands because the secretary was there. He says, you can fish tonight. The restrictions have been lifted. I said, well, I can come tonight. And he said, yeah. So I went home. I got my stuff. And uh, it was one of the very rare occasions where I'd bought any bait off anybody. But I, w- I won't go into it too much. But anyway, I found all these fish. And he'd give me these pallets as well, this bloke had. Uh, well, I'll tell you who it was. It was uh, Mick Richardson. Uh, I forget his bait company's name. Um, Supremo Baits, I think it was. And anyway, I mean, I knew Wedge was like the back of my hand by then. And I found all these fish at the top end. And um, I ended up, there was some stock fish in there by then as well, year 2001. So it was a different lake than it was in 95 and 96. And I had, I think I had 13 bites in one night. It was the best session that I've ever had on there. But most of them were these stockies. And, and I was using back leads and I was fishing across the far margin with one rod. And it was like about, it's about 70 yards away. And in the morning, uh, I'd, I'd had an active night like, and I'd, most of the fish was off this near margin. And this fish topped out on the far margin where I was fishing. It came straight out the water. And I thought, that's right over my rig. And at least, at least five to 10 seconds passed before I even got a bleep on my rod. And I was hooked up on that fish and I'd got a bat lead on. I'd got a bat lead on. And that was when yeah. I realized that these bat leads were injuring indication big time. So if you're fishing for odd, tricky fish, you could have a bat lead on and they could pick you up and you wouldn't even know about it like you've done there, you know. Yeah, well, when you think about it, right, the 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 silt at Auxton, um, it has like that little sediment layer, doesn't it? Yeah, well, it, it goes over everything, settles over everything right yeah. when, when you're in. Well, if you had a bit of wind... Um, a bit of toe in the water. What tends to happen is you get a lot of silt building up on the line before your back lead. Yeah, uh, like say so you, you end your rod, your lines get into the water. You got your back lead on the bottom. What happens is the the, the sediment's going to and fro, and basically it jams. You know, you can have the best back lead in the world. Yeah, it, it's, it's, just, it's, jam. it's just a pivot point for them, mate. And, they yeah, could, and because exactly. of, because there's a bit of a tension there on the back lead, it can work as a pivot point, and they can work against that pivot point, and you don't even get a bleep. Honestly. Yeah. And, do you know, and do you know something, mate, right? Over the course of the years, I've just mentioned to you that two people had caught carp, almost in the depths of winter. I think it was 2010. Yeah, well, that's even, that's even worse, isn't it, to winter? Yeah, don't move but, line, but we? We, had a, yeah, we had a real cold winter then, didn't we? It, it had just thawed out, mm. and it, it wasn't fishing very well at all. Yeah, all yeah. day, anything coming out, and uh, this guy come down through in the middle of the night, John, John, it was, you know, and my rods, right? It looked like nothing had moved. My bobbin was still there, and I hadn't, yeah. had, a, I hadn't had a bleep. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I just had a fish on your rod, and he would he, actually cut my rig off my line and brought it to me. Yeah. So, like he, so he'd lesson. landed. He'd landed it as a trailer, Addy. Well, he thought he got. He thought it was his fish. Yeah, but he landed it as a trailer, Addy. Though. In, yeah, in, and, in, and, in and he, couldn't, he, he couldn't understand how I hadn't heard it. And then, but when he got to me, rods and nothing had moved. Um, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to get your head around because I sat there then for the next few hours thinking, "How's that happened?" You know. But oh no! I mean, and there's no two ways about it, mate. That. If you've got a particularly heavy sedimentary bottom like that, and you're using bat leads, because I've I've experienced it where I've had uh, pickups with bat leads on, and I've known about having the fish on before I've even had a bleep on my rod. Yeah. Well, so bring it back into uh, into, into sort of 1992, um, and so what what we used to do 
It's because obviously we we were using backlights. Um, you get the odd blip in the night, and and in in the, in the night you're not going to really be investigating anything, are you? Mm. You know, um, you, don't, you don't really be recasting unless you have to. You know, I'm not saying you know I wouldn't if I had a few bleeps, then you would investigate it, but you get the odd bleep anyway. So what we did was first thing the next morning, every every morning, even if we, even if we hadn't had a bleep, what we'd do we get up half an hour before first light. Tie, tie up some some stringers. We just used to put like a four bait stringer then. So yeah. we were using like a what's that bloody not supernova before supernova. It was uh, Merlin, I think it was. Yeah, uh, that was what using, I used to use, mate. Yeah, Merlin. I liked yeah. it. I like Merlin. Oh, we were using that Merlin. You needed a stringer on, otherwise, you know, you were sitting there thinking, "Is it tangled?" Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, with them soft braids, if you don't put a bag or a stringer on or at the clip, you could be in a tangle, couldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so what we used to do first, religiously, first thing in the morning. I mean, sometimes obviously we catch in the night anyway. Uh, but what we do first thing in the morning, up, up half an hour before first light, get tying up some strings, etc. And then uh, as soon as it was light enough to see where you could cast, chuck out, and then watch the water. And then basically, then yeah, we as quiet as we could. Oh, well, more for other anglers than the fish. <laughs> and um, basically, we'd watch the water because the fish would start bubbling. I mean, from memory, if you if it was sort of June time, it probably would, you know, it comes light about four o'clock. We can't say four o'clock, something like that. You might, you might not until about, say, half past five, you'd see the fish start bubbling. Um, later on in the year, they seem to be bubbling closer to first light. I mean, this is off memory. Obviously, it's years ago. And uh, anyway, so basically, we'd <clears throat> chuck out fresh stringers, 30 baits, you know, 30, that's 30, 40 mil baits, and then watch the water. And then throughout that morning, we probably readjust one rod to cause where, where the fish were feeding on the blood worm. It sort of from week to week, it could have been in, in, in slightly different areas. So you got your spot. Well, it'll, cha so you it'll change, won't it? Because they'll only yeah, harvest yeah. so many bloodworms and then they'll change the patch, won't they? Yeah. So you know, that, that could be casting off rod length to your right, but you're only fishing 50 yards, 45, yeah. 50 yards out. So it was, you know, it was nothing to, to do that, you know. Um, and, that, and, that, and, that, and, and that was basically ensuring that we're presented and fishing at first light through the feeding time. Yeah. Whereas, yeah. say, if you if we didn't do that, like most of the other, 90% of the other anglers weren't, they'd be sitting there, and either a bream could have been messing around with the bait, and the, their hook could be hooked in some uh, silt or a twig on the bottom. Yeah, yeah. You know, where they were but, mucking around with them all night. But, so that goes but, back again. So that goes back again to with the back leads. It's like um, it's like having a television air. Yeah, you know, imagine having a television air set up on your house. Then somebody sneaks up on your roof and, and turns it a bit until you got a fuzzy picture. That was like the back leads were creating that fuzzy picture because yeah. you didn't know whether what was what was going on. You needed to reassure yourself by putting them rod back out first thing in the morning, ready for that feed, feeding time. Yeah, after the sediment had built up. Yeah, yeah. Well, and also being messed around with because there was a load of bream in there at the time, and the bream, yeah, you yeah. could have, you could have sometimes half a dozen bream a night. Yeah, yeah. You know. Um, well, well uh, but, I think the, that's um, that's a good point. What you've made though about the um, about the fish changing slightly the spots after they've harvested the bloodworm and stuff. Because I mean, I think people think a good spot's a good spot forever, and that's just not the case, is it? No, uh, you know, I mean, on there, you know, we'd start off maybe in June. Say, say for example, in the first bay fishing, say the old Peg 7, as it was, and you're fishing straight out in front of you, you know, within a few weeks, if you're getting that swim every week, if you could, to, to continue what was going on, um, the, the spot would probably be two rod lengths to the right. Exactly. That, or, I mean, or, you know. Or there'd be other spots, there'd be other spots getting... You know, sometimes we just have to put a sneaky rod out because of that many spots. We didn't have enough rods. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, that's what I mean. I mean, the place where I'm fishing now, um, 
I mean, it's a gravel pit, and, and I'm still learning the ropes on there, but everyone will tell you. I mean, I try not to listen to it too much because it clouds your judgment a bit, but everyone will tell you certain spots, and don't get me wrong, good spots can stay good spots for ages, but I've always found that the learning stay good for so long, and, you know, especially if it's like how you were fishing there, where you're basically exploiting natural larders, the bloodworm areas, you've got to move your rods. When the fish have at them out, you've got to move your rods to where the fish are moving to. Yeah, yeah, and, and also, say when you've got fish bubbling over your bait, I, I used to, me, me and my mate Gary, we, used to, we never used to have his binoculars out of his hands. And you're only looking like 40 yards out, 40, yeah, 40 to 50 yards out. And we were watching trails bubbling, and, and we could basically count the... Well, it's only an estimate. How many fish were in the swim? He didn't know whether they were bream or carp. Yeah, yeah, because you're seeing a patch um, here, a patch there, yeah, so yeah. you're thinking there's four fish at least there. Yeah, the the carp tend to make, to, to to like make lines like like if you can imagine them swimming forward as they're eating, whereas a bream would be dippers. Yeah, like I you mean, know, bream, you... bream, bream stay on one spot for ages because I know that from when I used to fish for bream yeah. tipping. You you could fish for bream quiver tipping and if your root length length wasn't right you were never hooking them because they don't move much when the feeding bream don't no and not, if you're using light to tackle then obviously if, you, if you've got a carp rig you just you just hook themselves don't on a carp yeah yeah but yeah but when you tip feeding, when you're tipping yeah. on a swim feeder i mean i used to do quite a bit of it in the early 90s and and you could have tweaks on your tip little poles say four or five mil and you wouldn't strike at them <laughs> And you knew it's because they weren't moving all day at all. So if you shortened your root length down, you do come. You know, you do yeah. come down. Once you shortened it down by six inches, whatever, from two foot to eighteen inches, you'd start hooking them. And it's because they're. It's, I'm. I'm pretty much convinced it's because they weren't moving much while they were feeding. Yeah, and and also, you know, a bit we advance on to what we've just been talking about. About you know, so imagine the scenario. I've got like fresh rods that have been chucked out. The fish have come, started bubbling over me. One or two might have been head shouldering. And, uh, and I don't know, they're right on top of me and nothing's happening. So basically, what, to, made the decision to wind that rod in and, and, and refresh it. And after yeah. five minutes, it's gone and I've had one. Well, I mean, as soon as you've said that, that takes me right back to that first couple of years on Wedgwood's, 95, 96. I would religiously redo the rods and people will frown on it now, but I would redo the rods at bite time. And for the simple reason being that I started believing because I was using supple loop lengths like, like you, uh, I started believing that the, the rig wasn't sitting right. So I'd reel in and I'd redo it with a, with a string on or a bag or whatever. And like you say, the amount of times you do that and cast it back to the same spot, what you've been fishing and catch a fish within an hour, that, yeah. it's unbelievable. So, you know, I'm definitely of the opinion that it might have already been picked up by a carp. You haven't took it. The rig's not sitting right, so you've got to refresh it. And people don't seem to do that much anymore. No, I think, well, I, th I think, I mean, bottom baits, you know, you, you, there's, a, there's a great risk of, um, depending on what lake, type of lake bed you're fishing on, um, in regards to, what it's getting hook up on, sorry, hook up in. So, say for example, you're sitting there with a fish bubbling it right over the top of you. Yeah, it might have sucked your rig in and whatever. But, but it might have again, your hook might be snagged. Yeah, yeah. You know, or, and, or or your hook's gone blunt or anything. Yeah. So making that decision to wind that rod in, it's a hard decision to make. But you know, it, it, it was hard at first. But the amount of times uh, I've done that, it works, mate. It works. Yeah. I, mean, I, I know. Like you say, I know it works. It does work. You know, and, and back in that sort of era, most of the other anglers were snoring in the bibbies while we, this is going on. And we, we were up, up sit there watching it going on. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, so that, that was an edge in itself. I mean, that's why that's why you've gone over to, in the modern day, where people always want to rig what resets itself. Exactly, yeah. And pop-ups. Yeah. You know. But, but, I mean, pop-ups is another discussion because I, I don't believe you'll always catch the fish on pop-ups. Like, I mean, that's another discussion. But 
I don't believe that you will always get the take on a pop up. You know, I think sometimes they'll ignore it completely. Yeah, I, th- I think it's that. I think you know, we can, you know, as you say, that's another conversation itself. I think uh, the height of a pop up, definitely. Um, yeah, you know, but again, there's been that many big fish caught on, say, the stiff inch in its, yeah. in its, in its original form. I mean, the, the, they're fantastic rigs for big fish. Pop up rigs are, but I mean. I can go back as recently as July this year when we went down we went down Swan Valley in Yateley on a stag do, um, eleven of us. And um it was hard fishing, but then again, it's always hard with lakes with big fish and like that. They're never easy when there's when the fish are big. And yeah. a few of the lads had a lot of fish over them uh on the first night and they never had a bleep. And, and I just said to one of them in passing, I said, I bet you've been on pop ups, haven't you? Because I know where, I know how he fishes. And he says, yeah, on both rods. I says, well, get yourself a bottom bait out there. He says, well, the bottom's a bit dirty. I said, don't matter. I said, put a stick on it or something. I said, get a bottom bait out there. I said, you'll probably get a bite. Because they were fizzing and everything. The, f- the fish were sheeting up. And he, yeah. he didn't swap over. He didn't swap his rigs over until the last night. And lo and behold, on the last night, he caught the only fish that, that anyone caught out there. But he probably could have been catching after the first night if he'd have changed yeah. his rigs. You know, because yeah. because I'll I'll tell you now I've had it on weedy waters where you'll think you get you you might have even been catching on pop ups, and you and you've had fish on you, and I've done it I've done it where I've changed over to bottom baits even in weed, and I've caught fish when when I've I've known I've been on fish and I couldn't catch yeah. one on the pop ups. Yeah, I mean it all depends again on what on what type of weed. I've never I would never ever cast a bottom bait onto silkweed. I know, I know people do, but well, for I, me, I, 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 I've, I've got lo- I've, I've got plenty of fish and saltweed, mate, <laughs> on bottom baits. And you know, uh, people say like you're better off using a barbel hook if you game do that, so the the hook doesn't sort yeah. of catch on to the saltweed. But I, I don't know. I mean, uh, honestly, something... John, I, I've caught fish, mate. That's the first place that ever taught me about pop ups weren't always catching the fish. It was full of saltweed, um, and I'd been catching all the time on pop ups. And one night, I did one night, and the fish were all over me and my mate. And I woke up in the morning, I said, we ain't catching these on pop-ups. And I put I put balanced bottom baits out, and I had two fish in about an hour and a half. And and that was in, that was in Silkweed. That's fair enough. I mean, the, where I'm fishing now, uh, pretty much 90% of the bottom is uh, Silkweed. Well, it, it's it's a mental barrier, isn't it? You think to yourself, there's no way I'm going to be presented. But I always used to just put a stick on, put a stick, a crush boilie on, and just leave it there so you know it's presented reasonably. Uh, I mean, it depends on the thickness of the saltweed. But, I mean, like like Matt Kirkham, who I had on the first podcast, it's very rare he'll use a, a pop-up, and he's caught loads of fish out of weed on bottom baits, all, to, all sorts of weed. Yeah, that's fair enough, though, fair play. I mean... It is a bit of a mental barrier, and I must admit, uh, when I was, you know, obviously we can come on to it in a bit, uh, about solid bags, etc. but I say to you now, I've never, well, no, not I've never, I've only, I've only fished pop-ups in there, in a solid bag. Mm. Um, but the pop-ups in a solid bag are very low to the bottom. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, me me personally, like, I don't think you need a pop-up in a solid bag, because it, it'll flatten the weed anyway, it'll flatten the weed anyway. I always uh, get it in my head. And this goes back to the, the, another water that we'll come on to in a bit. Um, depends on the colour of the saltweed, uh, of its density. If it's the, sort of the light green variety, uh, I think it's down to its age more than species. Yeah, it, go, it goes black when it gets a bit old, saltweed does. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that fish is water, uh, which we'll come on to. A bit later, um, and uh, gin clear t- traditional dog gravel pit with with uh, it's like an egg gin clear water, um, and you could see the, the the weed glowing out in the lake. It's only six acres, so obviously it wasn't very wide. It was probably eighty yards wide than most, but obviously you're only looking forty yards if it's eighty, aren't you? Yeah, 40 um, yards range maximum. Well, yeah, unless you're fishing yeah. far margin because there's nobody there. <laughs> well, well, anyway, you could climb trees as well. Um, some decent cl- tree climb, you know, climb, 
trees to climb. And uh, you'd see this glow. And uh, anyway, there was that. There was the. There was like the same sort of siltweed in the margins, like deep margins as well in areas. And you could see the the the, the siltweed glowing in the margins there. You could drop a rig into it, it disappear. It's gone. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I, I probably took that as you know. Yeah, I mean, not, not, I mean, ev- everyone's uh, perception and ultimate definition of siltweed can be massively varying because. On some waters, siltweed's just... I mean, on the water, the first one of the first waters I fished with a lot of siltweed in, it was just on the bottom and it was no deeper than six inches. Yeah. You know, it was no deeper than six... In fact, in fact, how I, how I used to fish it and how I used to define if I'd got a spot where I could fish is, I would put a marker out with a six-inch boom on the, on the, on the lead. So I knew that if it wasn't... As long as it wasn't deeper than six inches... My marker would pop up, and as long yeah, as my marker yeah, popped, yeah. as long as my marker popped up, I'd be happy to put a bottom bait on there. I mean, I did fish pop ups most of the time, but I did have a couple of sessions on there where I had to swap over to bottom baits to catch fish, and that was still in that siltweed, and I was still catching fish in the siltweed like that. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's 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 that sort of. I mean, you sit behind your rods and you're investing your time, and uh, if, you, if you're sitting behind the rods and you're not comfortable. And then it's you know what I mean. Then I mean I'm not just talking about this about myself. Ge- generally, anglers when they when they any sort of weed, a lot of anglers are quite fearful, aren't they? Um, yeah, we. I mean, we weed puts people off, but I mean, I was late really fishing somewhere with weed, and it was it was probably as late as well. I did fish one water uh, about year two thousand with a bit of weed in, but I didn't fish it much, and uh, so I didn't really. Didn't really learn a massive amount about weed fishing on there, but in 2009, when I fished somewhere with a lot of weed in, that, that was when everything all changed about me thinking about fishing and weed. It completely changed. I mean, it was mainly yeah. pop-ups I was catching on, but not always. So I learned then that, you know, even though it's weedy, it's not always the pop-ups who are going to do the, do, do the job like, you know. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. I totally agree. Yeah, definitely. Um, I say, but I mean, I don't know if I'm jumping a bit too far now, but when I started using solid bags, it was about it was 2018. It was a, it was a summer pretty similar to what we've got now, and the water level had dropped on the on the lake, and uh, you go up in chest waders, and the and the the Canadian was top to bottom where I, where I've been fishing, and I, I had actually spent a couple of weekends fishing an area where. Uh, Literally, when you're looking over the lake, you can't see a spot where I made a spot myself by you know, them castable weed rakes. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd spent like an hour upon hour, and I've got a big pile of weed. Back, I will, you know? I will yeah. tell you now, though, John, um, if anyone's listening who's on anywhere, what's weedy? Those big gardener weed rakes, have you seen them, the bigger ones? The, the, big, the ones that are about, say, 12 inches wide? Yeah, I've got one of them I have, mate, and they are, they are a good tool. In fact, the... <laughs> in fact, right, I've got a story about that. I found that in Tunstall Park, mate, because <laughs> I've only ever fished Tunstall Park about five times, and it was in the winter, and I found that weed rake in Tunstall Park, and I've had it, like, for two years, and I've been using that when I need it. And it was yeah. it was brand new. Somebody must have just lost it in the margins, and I've got it now, mate, and it's in my bag. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I got one off eBay. I got I got one of the garden small ones. Yeah, they're about twenty quid. Them biggins are, mate. It's about twenty quid, yeah. I think. Yeah, well, I got one off eBay. It was like a triangle type shape. Yeah, a castable one, and I was and I was casting it like eighteen wraps. And uh, yeah, the cliff. smaller ones. Yeah, yeah. Well, it wasn't the garden one. It was like a. It was a, I'd have to. I don't even know where it is. I think it's in my bag. I'll have to send you a photo of it. Um, it's like a triangle shape at the front. And um, it's a bit a bit similar to the to the garden, but the, instead of having like the the little prongs, it's just, it's just like studs, if you like. Yeah. But the ones that what the the sheer shape would it be like like a triangle, um, like a like an arrow, not more more of an arrow than a triangle. Sorry, when it when it casts out into the weed, it's sort of you know like the Canadian. It's sort of the Canadian bunched up behind. Yeah. And it snapped it out. 
Yeah. So you were bringing back. You were, you were bring if you hit the clip into the spot, you were bringing back um, a bunch of weed. What you pulled out the bottom, or mm. it had snapped at some de- different depth. Yeah, so I mean, I, I was, can, Canadians. I reckon Canadians one of the hardest weeds for fish over. To be honest with you, it is if you're fishing a new clink. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah with bag. bags. I mean, with bags, it's probably a bit different, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. The th- one of the first things I learned uh, from a conference point of view is um, is basically I'd be wading out into the lake, like I said to you before. I'd be, re- yeah, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be wading out like about 35 yards. It's hard to fucking believe what I was. I was wading out 35 yards, right to the top of my chest waders, and I got some polarised glasses on. It was like looking to an, you know, into a, into a bath of the water was that clear, and I could see the strands of the weed going to the bottom. And it's it's obviously the reason why a bag is uh, very effective in that air. And that's yeah, sort of, it, I mean, it just goes straight down, doesn't it? It's a it nice heavy down, bag. It just it? goes straight down. Got, it make it makes its own spot if you like, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I was I was making these. Um, well, I made a area. Like I say, it was like a the the, the the lake was like a weed top to bottom in this particular area where I've been fishing. And uh, like I said, I've got that weed rake and got, got seen that for a couple of hours. It's, you know, 18 wraps every chuck, you know, working your way across and that. And, and, and then when I could like, took that, that off and put a lead on, I thought, God, I've made a bit of a difference here. You know what I mean? You, can, you, know, you, you look at the yeah, weed. You, get, yeah, you, you were getting a drop on that with a lead now, were you? Yeah, not, not, not as, as good as... As it, in, if it was, there was no weed there altogether, but yeah, it was. Uh, you had to put quite a light lead on as well to, <coughs> yeah, you know, to, to make it to make the so it didn't drop too quick, and you, and you could feel it bumping. You know, yeah. um, it was just about just in the range. I mean, there'd have to be no wind, nothing to get that that sensation, if you like, of that drop. Um, yeah, and then you know, like I say I started catching a few fish out of that area <coughs> then. Um, on the on the bags, like, um, but I mean, I think we're jumping a bit too far, aren't we? Well, I mean, yeah. Well, there's there's a lot there's a lot to talk about, isn't there, with this bag fishing? What you've done, because yeah, I mean, let's be honest, you've gone to town with it, haven't you? With the different things that you've been putting in the bags, and oh yeah, I mean, well, the results you've had with it. I mean, the results you've had with it have been well, they've been pretty much well, they've been yeah, very yeah, good, haven't yeah. they? Been very good. Yeah. Yeah, back in the them first couple of first couple of years, um, when I was on there, you know, yeah, um, and, and there's like obviously there was things that I was doing, um, I, I, you know, as you said before, um, I, from a bait from a bait point of view, I've, I've probably learnt as much as I want to, if you know what I mean. Mm. You know, without well, well be- before we before we jump into this. Bag fishing, what you did, because I know this has been one of the methods what's been very successful for you on this. I mean, we'll call it the Midland Syndicate. I mean, yeah, it's uh, what is it, 27 acres? Yeah, I think, I think it's about 27 acres. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's some big fish in there, isn't there? I mean, how, how many fish yeah. is in there, John? Roughly, I don't really know to be fair, mate. I don't know, it's not Co- low stock, by a couple of hundred, few hundred, few hundred. Um, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't, I really don't know, mate. I don't know. Um, it's, all, it's, it's I mean, there's been regular stockings as well, um, probably since since that first winter in 2018. A few went in there, and then you know, you know, he's, 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 pick, he's picked the best fish you can possibly pick yeah. to put in there for the future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, the, I mean, that's you know, that's another subject of massive discussion. I mean, there's there's lots of strains now, good good strains of fish that. Well, grow well. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, there, there's Englishes you can get because they've been over here for years. These strains have, and there's loads of strains of carp now that will get to thirty pound within ten years or less. There's there's loads of them, and and then in a in a vet general perspective in fishing, for someone who owns a lake, it, ten years is not a long time, is it? For wait for, yeah. I mean, it, it might be in this day and age because everyone wants everything instantly. But you know, if you if you can stock fish it, let's say. Four pound and in ten years the thirty pounders. To me, that's a very good return because I can remember years ago, same as probably them fish in Auxton. Um, 
Corp used to take years before they they got they'd got big like a, a reasonable size. They'd, they'd take a long time, wouldn't they? They would, yeah, they would. But I think it's also I think it's also probably a reflection of how much food goes in lakes nowadays. They get fed a lot better, don't they? It also depends on what type of lake it is as well. Oh I yeah, mean, definitely. The environment's massively a massive factor. Yeah. That's that's pivotal on yeah. the on the progress of the fish. I mean, a weedy lake is generally richer than a lake that isn't weedy. I mean, it's not always the case, but weed weed seems to help them quite a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, well, over the last few years, um, the the silt weed's taken a, a big hold on the lake, and um, before that, um. You know, you, you you see the odd shrimp. You wouldn't you wouldn't really pull shrimps in 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 Canadian, anything yeah. like because it's not that dense enough that you you, you wind it in over the jaws. It's a different kind of yeah. weed, yeah. I think it, I yeah, think they, 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 I think they probably fall off it, you know, on the way. Yeah, in. exactly, exactly. Whereas whereas in this last sort of four years or so, um, this this uh, silk weed, sorry, silk weed's taken a hold. And basically, it's created it's created habitat. So the shrimps yeah. and hoglouse and all the other bits and bobs and yeah, uh, you know, um, and and everything can hide as well. Like, like damselfly nymphs. Yeah, you know, the, the damselfly hatches on there. I mean, amazing. That, I mean that's why, that's why I'm not scared of weed at all. Because I mean, uh, the first water that I started fishing with weed in was like 2006, but I wasn't fishing the weedy areas. But whenever I did bring the weed in, it was just rammed with natural food. Um, yeah. And then, but then when I started fishing somewhere that had loads of weed in it, because that, that was weedy, but, and then I had to fish in the weed. And then once I realized, I thought, well, that's where all the food is. Because like you say, it was always the, the shrimps. I mean, the shrimps were massively abundant in the weed, in the silt weed. And, that's where the carp are getting feed, and it's that's where they're going to be eating. Yeah, they'll be picking and sifting them out, won't they? Be, yeah, they, yeah. They, I mean, that's, they, that's so. If they're in there, mate, you won't get your rigs in there, don't you? You know. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's what obviously makes fishing hard as well, because if there's if the yeah the there's that much sort of habitat that uh, that the, the natural food's living in, covering a large percentage of the lake, then it's yeah. the old uh, needle in the haystack theory. Well, I mean. I mean, the lake I'm fishing now uh, on Pride, mate. Um, it's there's there's loads of natural food in there, but just one, just one source of natural food for them in there. The amount of it's phenomenal. Zebra mussels. I mean, yeah. it's absolutely rammed with zebra mussels. I mean, and they they've probably got me the ultimate food for carp because although they're a mussel, the shell's not very hard, so they'll break them super easy. And then there's flesh inside the shell. And yeah. it's absolutely rammed with zebra mussels that lake. Well, well both of them well, lakes are there. Well, that that place is as well. Zebras and swans. Yeah, I Lynch, mean, you Lynch. know, and like Trenton was, there was a lot of zebra mussels, uh, swan mussels in Trenton. But I mean, I don't think carp in England. I mean, the big ones might do, but I think the English carp only eat zebra mu- uh, swan mussels when they're a small size. Because yes, I mean, yeah, you're, when they're small. Yeah. you'll go you'll go on some lakes and and you'll find. Tiny little swan mussels, you know, half an inch, inch long. Um, yeah. And I've found spots on lakes where there's just loads of smashed up swan mussel shells, but you'll only find them from a boat. You won't do, you won't do it with a marker or nothing because you can't feel them properly. Well, you can feel them a bit, but I've only found them by using a boat. That's how I found them. And when you find them spots, because it sounds a bit silly, but I'm hundred percent convinced that carp take. Take take swan mussels back to certain areas while while they're eating them because you'll find massive concentrations of smashed up shells. Yeah. Well, the, those zebras, I've I've reeled them in, uh, impaled. Oh yeah, on I've, I've had and them on my rig a few times, mate. Already, I've only been in twelve months. Yeah. That, that's fishing a pop up as well. Yeah, yeah, you will, mate. Yeah. Oh, obviously, when you bring it in, you, you, your hook goes to the bottom as, as your line drags across the bottom. But yeah, you know, where uh, many a times certain swims. You know, um, I mean, the, they they've they've got me one of the best sources of food going for carp. Those zebra mussels, yeah. I mean, because they just seem to proliferate that that well. There's, I mean, there's literally millions of them in Pride Lake. There's millions of them in there. Yeah, it's, it's, it all makes uh, the fishing order from a, a present presentational point of view, and obviously. Um, 
basically if you can if you can if you're competing against um you know that sort of much natural foods and the Yeah, mate. Um, you know, as, as you're talking about the zebras, the swan mussels, and uh, you know, you got the the shrimps, or grouse. I mean, caddis. You know, the habitat and silkweed. Um, you know, and if you got that all across the bottom of your lake, um, you know, it's. Obviously, the, the fish can be quite selective, don't you think? Oh, well, I mean, yeah. I mean, you can understand why some lakes are quite tricky when you see how much natural food's in them. Yeah. Because, I mean, people forget that as much as as much bait as some lakes might be seen, they're not seeing it all the time. And if people think carp don't feed every day, then they're insane because they're eating all the time, carp are. Yeah. So if there's no yeah. bait, if there's no bait there for them, John, They've got to eat something, mate. So they're on natural food, aren't they? Oh, definitely. And then, and then obviously, talking, you know, we we're, were on about earlier on auction about you know the, the bubblers. You know, they, that's basically bloodworm beds. And, yeah, yeah. Um, you just start identifying the natural law, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah. And what I find as well, I mean, we're fishing on rail pits from the last sort of three walls of fished on. There is times where you'll see them bubbling. But they're very, very, very tiny pinprick bubbles, and you wouldn't know unless you've got your binoculars on the water when it's calm, where they, where they're picking out the sediment. You know, whatever they're eating at that particular moment in time, it could be build up a gas under silt weed. I don't know. Yeah. But um, you know, um, definitely, uh, you have to have your binoculars in your hand at all times, especially when it's calm water in the morning and you're, you're looking out. You know, where your baits are. Oh yeah, I mean. Yeah. I mean, observation is one of the most important parts of carp fishing, isn't it? Oh, definitely, definitely. You know, uh, and and I would say, I would say another another very important part of carp fishing, which you haven't always got the luxury of doing, is getting on the lake, even if you're not fishing. I mean, that's a massive edge, I think. But you can't. Talk, I mean, I've never been able to do any of that for ages because I don't drive. Uh, but I'll be totally honest with you. If I could drive, I'd have a trip up where I'm fishing during the week just for have a look around, because yeah. that's, you know, that 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 the amounts the amounts of information what you can gain from walking a lake uh, and having a good look round, even if you're not fishing. I mean, and we could talk about baiting up as well, but that's another issue. But the amount of information you gain from just walking around somewhere. Uh, because it's all observation, isn't it? It's all building towards the bigger picture to try and catch one, isn't it? You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, I've I've never really been in that position much over the over all the time I fished. Um, maybe that syndicate in Cheshire back in the early nineties. I, I might have been down there one or two times a week, tricking a, a couple of tigers and a couple of peanuts in etc. Back of the snags. But uh, yeah, we're having a walk round, just a general look, see if there's anybody fishing, etc. You know, it keeps you, it keeps you in tune before you get down there. It keeps you in tune, mate. I mean, you know, your eyes are your biggest tool, aren't they, in carp fishing? Yeah, definitely. Eyes, ears, and then uh, a more modern day mobile phones because you can talk. To oh yeah, on the lake you're yeah. There. I mean, it's all it's all changed, isn't it? I mean, there yeah. is, there is. I, I do call it phone fishing because that's how some people fish. They fish, yeah. with, they fish with the phone. They want to know who's on where, where they're fishing, who's catching what. Uh, but I mean, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit. I, I mean, I'm not old. I'm not as old as you, but I like just doing things my own way. I like know a little bit about what's going on where I'm fishing. But the journey is as important as the capture for me, and I like just do it my own way and find out as I go along. That's part. Of, that's part of the enjoyment for me. To be honest with you. Yeah. I understand that, mate. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, anyway, um, what, what I think, I think, in terms of Auckston, I don't know how far you want me to go on to, on there in terms of, of um, what year, how many years, or whatever. Because I did, I did spend a lot of years on there. Well, I, um, I mean, you, 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 the guest this week. It's carte blanche, mate. You can do, you can talk about whatever you want. I mean, I do want to eventually at some point get onto this bag fishing because i mean 
a lot of people don't associate PVA bag fishing with big fish, but I think after you've spoke a little bit, they might be a little bit surprised about what you've caught on solid bags. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, talk about the water that I joined in 2014. Um, it's, it's like a six-acre mature gravel pit. It's been it was dug in the, the early to mid-80s, as far as I know. Yeah. Um, and it yeah, had it been... Was. It was a prolific water um, for carp before I fished there. But over the years, the, there have been a couple of oxygen crashes, which had killed quite a few of the carp. So there wasn't so many left in, but there was still a couple of big ones left in there, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, that, that does happen, doesn't it? That does happen. Yeah. I mean, I, I believe, uh, I think I'm right in saying that the Lynch Hill waters started off with a lot of fishing and there was match angles on there and stuff. Um, and then they just turned into big fish waters. And I think I'm right in saying that, especially with Christchurch. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's why some of the fish in there have got damaged mouths and stuff because it's all the natural progression of different waters, isn't it? Some waters start off overstocked and then the, the numbers dwindle down and then all of a sudden it becomes a specimen water. And, and you know, and that's how it starts for some places. Yeah, yeah, but I tell you what, the the, the fish in that water. Um, I mean, I've skipped. I, I, I probably skipped a, a number of interesting waters I fished, where the fish were quite spooky. Um, to get to this particular water, but you know, a lot a lot of the time on this particular water, um, if you're there, you know, the angles would turn up, and, and, and depending on what they did, if they weren't quiet, um. And if they spotted, that was it. If they spotted, yeah, you may as well go home. I remember you saying that that was definitely you may as well, you, death. You, you may as well go home. The, the fish would retreat. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a backwater where you'd see them and there's no way you could fish in there. I mean, Tr Trenton was a bit like that, you know, because um, it's only shallow. I mean, there's not that many fish in Trenton. Well, there's a good few hundred in Trenton now, but there's certainly not as many as there was in there in the early 90s, but they didn't like spotting on there. I always found they didn't like spotting. Um, you wouldn't catch on the first night if you spotted. You wouldn't catch. Yeah, I, I fished Trentum, you know. Did you know that? No, 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 didn't they? Fish Trentum, John. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, do you know what? I was about to tell you. Um, I think the first time I fished Trentum, year wise, was 1994. Yeah, well, they'd have been, uh, they'd, you'd have been catching a few then. That was when people were catching a few. Well, it, it, what happened What happened was, I think, I'm not sure it was that year or the year after, but do you remember where the islands are on the wood side? Yeah, well, I mean, that, there's, you got, there's... You had that there's fencing, didn't you? Trenton. Sorry? But you had that fencing on, on the wood side. If you go up towards the monument at the top end... Yeah, well, um, yeah, yeah you'd, you'd got the rope. You'd got the rope going over the water. Well... Well, a couple of my mates fished in there at the weekend. That rope was moved so you could fish up there. Yeah, well, it was like a free for all then, mate. You, 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 there was that many <sighs> fish coming. I, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, I could do a podcast about Trenton, but somebody'd have to interview me because, uh, um, yeah, once that rope was moved, mate, and you could go down as it was called the sanctuary. It was known as the sanctuary yeah, then, and yeah. and I'll never forget as soon as that rope was removed. Because it was just a rope at first, um, yeah. and I went down one day on my, on my mountain bike because I'd always biking around there, and uh, they'd opened that sanctuary, mate, and I, I stood with one lad for about two hours, and in that two hours, he must have had about seven takes because it was just that's where the fish were. See, they were just yeah, they weren't yeah. used to being fished there at all. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you're right. Huh? Um... A couple of my mates, like my mate Gary and a lad named Andy, I think they were the first ones to get in there um, when when it opened that mm. weekend. And, and I, about, I, I mean, about, it's a lot, they had a few, didn't they? Uh, I can't. I think I think both had nineteen runs each. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. I think, something like that. Something like that. Um, I, I, I don't know how many they landed. I can't remember. I mean, uh, I mean, Transom now, you know, John. I don't know if you know a lot about Transom now, but. Most people who fish Trenton now don't even catch 10 fish a year. I've heard that. As a, as a lad who I do now, uh, keep in touch with the uh, East Fish on there for, 
for a number of years. Um, I'm not sure if he's still on there now. I've been in touch with him for a while. Um, I bet he had a hook ticket around about 2014. Yeah. And uh, we've kept in touch. Um, but I, I, I aren't sure what he's doing. I've, I've been in touch with him for, like, say, the last sort of six months or so. But he was on there, and he wasn't catching many out there. And he's a, he's a pretty decent angler. Yeah, I mean, it's totally different. I mean, I'm pretty much convinced that there was a fish kill on there because when I was a kid and I fished it, like I say, I mean, I'm going over old ground now, what I said on the last podcast, but I've had days down there between 90 and 92 where I've had over 10 runs on, on like, sometimes on one rod, you know, um, but there's definitely not that many fish in there anymore. Um, yeah. There's a few hundred in there, no two ways about it, but, I mean, it's 70 acres, so... A few hundred and seventy acres is not rammed, is it? You know what I mean? No, no. I tell you, I used to like about Trenton because we had a closed season ticket. You know, it was forty quid. You could fish it from March until June for forty mm. quid. Mm. And uh, I used to like the bank holidays and all the all the caravans used to come down. Yeah. And the water and all used to be open. <laughs> yeah, and the the bar, yeah, the bar, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's changed a lot, Trentham has. I will do a podcast about it one time, about Trentham, because I've got a lot of history with Trentham. Um, and I love the place. I really do love it. And I'll go back and fish it at some point, because I don't think the fish have peaked in there yet. I mean, it's doing them to £35 now, you know. Is it? Oh, yeah. Well. yeah, yeah, it's doing them to £35. I've had fish out of there to 33 mate, five years ago. Have you? Um, yeah. It's uh, it's doing some big fish now, Trenton. It's a different place than it was uh, thirty years ago, and they're still the same fish as well. They're still the same fish. I mean, yeah. I think some of the original big ones that were stock big, I think they are dead. But there's there's big fish in there now. I mean, well, the old it was the late record, but I think it's been broke this year. The mirror in there that used to come out a bit, the parrots. I had it three times. I've got a picture of that from the nineties at twelve pound, you know. Yeah. And I, I've also I've got a picture of uh, one of the lads had one that I called the little armadillo last year in February at twenty nine and a half, and I've got a picture of that when I caught it from the same swim at four pound twelve ounce. All right. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's nice, isn't it? History like that's nice, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Well, when I when I was on there, I I, I think I I did ninety four. 95 in the, in the close season as it was then that, that sort of particular ticket you could get um, I think the biggest one I'd heard of for the people who who, uh, who I knew who caught fish I'm, I'm sure it, it wasn't even £20 you know No it probably wasn't mate I mean mm. I, I mean I, you've listened to the first podcast I did with Matt and like I say it's all, it's all ground now but I only ever saw 120 caught out of Trenton up to 1996, so 120 pound to come yeah. out there. Yeah, my, my biggest fish out there was 16 pounds. Yeah. Um, yeah. Most of them were, were just 12, 13, well, you'd have, you'd have a few singles uh, up to 12, 13 pounds, and there was some ghost carp in there as well, weren't there? Yeah, well, there's quite a few now, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we won't yeah. talk about Trenton too much because. I'd like to do a podcast just about Trenton because I know quite a lot about the lake. I know, well, in fact, I know a lot about the lake because I know I know when the fish were put in and I know when they came in out the fountains and different stuff. I mean, there's other people who fished Trenton more than me, but I fished it, still, I fished it quite a bit in the early years, so I know a fair bit about Trenton. Yeah, yeah. Right, so, so if we move on to this this lake all about then, um, it's not it's not a million miles away from uh, Drayton Manor Park, this lake. Um, and it is a, it's a complex of gravel pits. Well, there's, 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 there's quite a lot of gravel pits on that area, isn't there? The Tame Valley, yeah. there's a lot of gravel pits there, isn't there? Yeah, M- most of them, most of them are either uh, RSPB and also, uh, unfortunately, a lot of them have uh, a for landfill as well, which not good for a carp angler, but no, um, no. yeah, that, that's what they do, they either reclaim them or. Use them as landfill, um, and so let's say this pit was dug in early to mid eighties. Um, I say it's been through a few different um, catastrophes, if you like, of um, fish kills due to uh, uh, oxygen crashes. 
Uh, anyway, it, 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 it did whittle down, and there was all the any silverfish in there uh, at the time I joined. Um, the only thing that we did see in the summer was a shoals of perch of about three inches long, and um, and, and, and carp, really. Uh, and there's tension there as well, sorry, there's tension there. Uh, the, the anglers on there, they were, got to know quite well who fished on there, you know, catching a tench was a result. <laughs> Which you know, for a car bang, you think, hang on a minute. But, yeah, I mean, you know, catching a tent, the, the tents were hard to catch. The tents the, the, the generally, the, the tents generally in, in in gravel pits where the balance is right are hard to catch because there's never loads yeah. of them. There's never loads of them. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so uh, I, went, I went on there. A sort of, you know, I didn't, I didn't really know that much about it. All I got was my you know, own eyes and ears and time. You know what I mean? And. Uh, I was going on there doing a couple of, a couple of nights a week, and uh, I soon cottoned on to the fact that if I was on there and there's nobody else on there, I would got more chance of seeing fish acting and behaving normally, if you like, than say if I got say if you got if I got there on a Monday, um, or say say Sunday evening or Monday Monday morning was better. Um, come come through the gate and uh, basically. He, he, the gate was probably 30 yards from the lake. You don't slam the gate. Some One of the lads, as Kev said to him, says, what do we do? We don't slam the gate. <laughs> I know it sounds a bit daft now, or, or then, or whatever. Um, he said, don't slam the gate. He says, all oh, the fish on there, you're here. <laughs> and I tell you what, right, I aren't kidding you. If, you. if you creeped in there on a Monday morning, nice Sunday morning, uh, I could I could literally spend six hours just walking, just, just doing laps. Then all of a sudden, oh, there's one there. There's one there. You know what I mean? I think, oh, hang on. Man. And then, or oh, some some mornings they'd be on the top. It's like basically as soon as you come down the down the uh, down to the lake from the gate, there's like a little dot island with a plateau behind it. And uh, if there's nobody on the lake, this is how it was then. If there's nobody on the lake. Um, that the, obviously the fish like getting up in the upper layers and not on that plateau, it was perfect for them. But as soon as, like, you, you, you there's like high banks to the side of where this plateau was, as soon as you start making a noise there, they're gone. And, um, and like I said to before, many a time, um, I've been on there, you know, tucked up out the way, just fishing and you know, make sure everything's right and then just leave it. Um, just trying to get my line lay right and not sort of make me presence so aware, you know, going to the extremes of being quiet, if you like. I only feel a couple of angles come on and, you know, it's not their fault, you know, everyone's got the same sort of right to fish, etc., and do what they want to do while they're fishing and may, maybe make a bit of extra disturbance. And then the fish would retreat into the back, back uh, into the sort of backwater. It was quite impossible. I mean, to be fair, in hindsight, I wish I'd had a go in there because I could have, I could have done some. I, I stuck, I stuck with the rules, if you like. I stayed within oh, the so confines. Oh, so you'd have to be doing a bit of swervy stuff down the backwater, would you? Uh, well, put it this way: um, from what happened in the end, I wish I'd have done it. Um. Because uh, it was basically, the, I mean, I'm jumping the gun here a bit. The, the fish, the, there's a few big fish in there, and there's two big ones. Um, so, <clears throat> what, what, how I can, right, so, I've got a couple of lads on there that said, if you're catching two fish in a season, you're doing all right. That, that's the type of water. No, so, so, it was, so it was an hard water then? It was an hard water? Yeah, yeah. Um, and... A couple of the, the my first year on there, I think I had I had two. And there's a guy on there. Um, I think he, had, he hadn't had anything for nearly a year and a half, something like that, nearly two years. Um, and then there was like there was there was, there was probably a handful of, of anglers on there who were fishing there who caught fish. Yeah. Um. There was different members that had walked round, saying they're going to do this, that, and the other. There was even other angles who were walking around because they knew, they still got a ticket, but they were looking to see if 
seeing fish were still in there. And it, I, I don't know. They were, it was quite a lot. My first year on there, there was quite a, there was quite a, a lot going on. Anyway, um, so that was 2014. 2015, um, I think I had three fish that year. Um, I think 28 pounds was the biggest, like a really old fish. Um, again, not many people caught fish. 2016, I didn't fish it. Um, basically, I got a year where I was got an over the overtime bug at work. I was working Saturday and Sunday, and a bit. So I basically, have, so you, have uh, bit, you have to money away so you could go for it. <laughs> yeah. I was, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, that that year was a write off. Um, 2016. Um, but le- later on in, in that, two, that in 2016, my mate had got a ticket for Catton. And, uh, and he said, oh, there's a fish in there, for £40 and whatever. So, ooh. I said, well, I think I'll be able to get a ticket. Anyway, he gave me the bloke's number. So I rang him and spoke to him on the phone. And sound guy, Ken, know his name is, I think. Um, anyway, he offered me a ticket. So basically then, um, what was it? November, it was up to, my ticket started in November 2016. Um the first bit of fishing I did for for months was basically on, on cotton. Um <clears throat> anyway, I had one first session, I had a twenty pound com and I noticed straight away that <laughs> there was a fair few members of this lake in the syndicate or whatever you want to call it. And uh, it turns out that there's like thirteen I think I think it was like ten acres, thirteen swims and ninety members. Um and yeah, and Prob- different probably, days. probably a little bit too many, really. But <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I said to mate Gary, I said, "Fucking hell, we have to, we have to a smash and grab on it." I said, yeah, um, some of the swim, it's, it's it's not the anglers' fault. Yeah, you know, but the water wasn't big enough, and to go an island on it, where people were casting on one bank would interfere with potentially could interfere with bank, anglers on another bank. Yeah. yeah. So. I quickly sort of worked that out. I thought, right, I need, I need somewhere where I can get un- un- unadulterated fishing. Um, so I got the, on the old Google Earth and started mapping it all out and whatever. Anyway, I did the session in uh, I think it was early February, and the lake the lake was packed. And I got a lad right next to me. Oh, I'm kidding! He was like, say, eight foot from me in this other swim, not fishing the same water, but you know, he he he, he turned up to fish. I think it was the last swim on the lake, and he got in there. I'm thinking this is ridiculous. Anyway, yeah, well, it's not up to me to tell him if you can or can't fish. Anyway, that that so that night went into uh, sorry, that day went into night and into the next morning. And then the next morning it was like a misty morning. I fucking see these see these fish bouncing out like what I was like on the on the bank where the River Trent is, and I could see these fish. They seemed to be about like thirty yards off the island, like right on front of you. No way I could cast there, but I probably crossed four people for the cast there. And I thought, hmm, okay. Anyway, it wasn't until maybe Easter time that I was, you know, I was watching. I mean, I was fishing every every week or every other week up until Easter. Anyway, Easter time comes, went on there. Did you catch uh, anything in the winter? I, well, I had I had one in the winter. I had a, had a Mid double, and uh, I lost one on a zig. Uh, that well, my, uh, imagine I've got three rods out. My mate's uh, got three rods out next yeah. to me, and um, within like half an hour, his three rods have been wiped out to my other two. <laughs> and then, and then, well, then it came well, off. Your, then... Well, if your zig it fish, <laughs> yeah, and then it <laughs> came off the net. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it's like that, middle yeah. of February. That was I, I seen I fucking mm. frost on the floor. Mm. Um, mad. Anyway, so um, moving on from that, um, like I say, move 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 towards Easter time, East or you know, Easter Bank holiday period. We 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 sort of said to ourselves, well, there's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday because that's our, our works. Have Monday and the Tuesday off as well. So, so we will go on the Sunday. Anyway, we went on the Sunday and it was all it was all sewn up, and I I was thinking about going home anyway. We stayed there chatting away, and just not long after sort of dinner time, anglers just started packing up and going. And I, so I said, Oh, God. I thought this is coming right here now. Anyway, so I thought, Okay, I'll get in this swim here. 
which was like, um, I don't know if people who know who know Cat, but it was like sort of if you if you're facing if you're on the car park and facing up the lake, you go on to the right hand side, past the island. I think it's I can't think what swim it's called. It's like shallow in the margins. I think it's called the second. That was called the second point. I'm not sure. Um, I thought that's where I'd seen them fish, and thought I thought oh, that's a start point there. You know what I mean? So anyway, ended up having five fish. Um, and not, nothing was really coming out of there. My mate Gary, he had a, I think he had a 27 pound common. I think I had a couple of low 20s. The rest were doubles. He had this 27 pound common from the, from the first point. From the first point swim. Anyway, so I thought, oh, we're on to something here. Anyway, so that, so that was, well, April, second, third week in April. I can't remember now. Anyway, within a few weeks, um, I, I've been having a few fish out of there, you know, just fishing single loop baits uh, into where, uh, well, basically what I'd done is mapped it out. I think it was 22 wraps would put you just short of halfway. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to have to pause the meeting there, then, John, because I'm going to have a pest, mate. <laughs> yeah, sound mate, yeah. All right, mate. There you go. Right, so I'd, I'd, I'd had them five fish, you know, just to re revise what I've just been on about. Uh, I'd, had, I'd had five fish at Easter. I had a couple of fish the week after, and basically what I'd done, I'd, I'd found out that the best time gone there would be a Thursday morning. So I was using the holidays at work to give myself the best chance of getting on there when when I could most likely to be able to get where I needed to get to. Um, but in, in the mornings, like I say, that you know throughout that time the fish were showing, and, and, I, kept, and I, kept, I kept seeing that big and show. Well, there was two big ones in there. There was one called the Twin which was around 37. And the other one was, it ranged at the time when I was on there between 41 and 43. Um, and I'd, I'd seen I'd seen a big fish showing in that area. But the, the, don't get me wrong, I, I think what happened at night time, it seemed like all the fish, or a majority of the fish, had congregated on, on, the, on the Trent Bank. And then in the morning, worked the way towards the island. Um, I mean that's the impression I got with that with because nearly every fish that was showing was facing with its back to the trout bank and pointing to the island and they were and they were moving from right to left so that's obvious um, that they what they were doing uh, <clears throat> anyway and so uh, Gary ended up catching that fish first that the one I can't think it's called star based it's called that the bigger Gary had it at 42. I think it was the last week of April. I, I, I caught it more or less exactly a week later. I mean, it wasn't, in hindsight, it wasn't a, an odd fish to catch, quite friendly fish. Um, there's a few people on there who've never caught and fished there for years, don't get me wrong. Well, I mean, but... that, 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 I mean that's always the case. I mean, <laughs> it yeah. was like the bigger man, Trentum, the parrot, I mean... Some people called it a mug, but most of them who called it a mug would never caught it, mate. You know, yeah. you get oh. fish that you get fish that get caught a lot more than others, but not everyone catches them, do they? No, no. Anyway, I, I ended up. Um, I got there on the stair Thursday morning. Um, that that I think I didn't I didn't think I, I had a twenty one about half seven Thursday night, and then Friday morning I had two commons just short of twenty pound each. And then that was usually it then. And uh, anyway, I was sitting there, uh, half 12 in the afternoon, just you know, just after midday, rod rips off. Anyway, it was that. It was that, it was that star base, £41. Mm-hmm. So, ooh, well, that one more to go. Was that, <laughs> you your, know I mean? was that, was that your first English 40? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never fished abroad. So, yeah, it was my first 40, £41. Yeah, well, pound, right? yeah. yeah I said English. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. You, know, uh, you know, it's a different ball game abroad, isn't it? It's a different ball yeah. game. Yeah, anyway, so I had that. So, right, there's one more. Then I won't get back on that other water. Do you know the one I was on about, you know, near Drayton Manor Park? Yeah, yeah, the one down there, yeah. Bodymore Heath, yeah. Yeah, Bodymore Heath, yes. Anyway, so... um. A week or so passed, and uh, then the other one was found dead. All right, the one called the twin. All right, so I thought, right, that's it, I'm done. Um, so I just 
went went, yeah, went from there and went to this other water. It just so happened, the timing was pretty perfect because this other water opened on the 1st of June. Uh, so I get there on the 31st of May at half past seven in the morning. I thought, spend all day having a loop. Anyway, there was a couple of other anglers there. I knew him. A lad named Sean. And I can't think of the other lad's name. Um, I can't think of his name. Anyway, no matter. So they they, they were up, uh, around the around the and about around the lake and what have you. And um, so I get I goes I did I did a couple of laps and I noticed that I seen the common. I thought, oh my god, it was what, massively the common, was, the big one. Yeah, it, it, it was massive. I was up a tree. Uh, and when you're up the street, it was like on the far. We got the car park at one end, and the opposite side of where the car park was a tree um, on the far bank. And you climb up the street, dead easy to climb. Like, mm. I, I'm no tree climber. Um, it's got to be easy to climb for me to climb. Um, and anyway, I was up the street, probably about 30 foot up the street. And I'd seen this come, and, it, and it's got like another two two fish with it, like, nowhere near the same size as I thought, my word. I thought, that's over £40 pound all day long. So I thought, so I sort of set my stall out into, thought, well, I'd start begin to step my stall out into where I was getting fish. I thought, well, he's hanging around here, or she's hanging around here. And in the, in the back water, that, that common was, and nearly, every time I saw it, but apart from a couple of times in the past couple of years, was, I'm, I'm talking now, this is May 2017. This is well, May stroke it, June the first, etc. Um, the only other times I'd seen it was in the backwater, uh, the non fishing out of bounds. It was impossible to fish there. Um, so I thought, well, he's, he's, he's knocking around there, and it was hangs around there. So I thought, I'll get in between. I don't kidding you, right? I got I got a rod out. I got I, I left most of my years in the car. Uh, this is still like about nine o'clock. Uh, on the on the thirty first of May, so we couldn't fish until like that, that following night. So, walk, walks up to the this area where I caught fish from before, which was basically in between where I can see it in this backwater. Uh, and a couple of plops, feeling for a donk with a lead, and that they're common. in this is these two mirrors just come darting past me, like literally half rod length out, went straight in this backwater. You could hear what I was doing. Yeah. I thought, I thought, oh my god, you know what I mean? So I thought, right, it's plan B. I thought he ain't gonna be hanging around here. Well, she ain't gonna be hanging around here. So we ended up fishing another area, but I didn't catch anything anyway. Push comes to shove and catch it. Who's it, who's it came on, on the next day? I'm sure he did, or the day after Joe, who we were on about the other day. Bertram. Yeah, I don't know if you want his name mentioned on it, like, but he, he turned right. up and he had was one. Joe, I remember, was he? Yeah, he, he had one. He had one. Uh, he had a twenty-eight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then anyway, that was. I think. I think he must have come on a couple of days after the start. Um. Anyway. So, <clears throat> this fish, this common was, was massive. You know, compared it, 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 its biggest weight. I think before. I'd seen it in the water. I, I in the in the situation it was in in terms of being spawn bound. But, before that, I think 37 might have been its biggest weight. I'd actually, I'd actually seen it on the bank. Somebody caught it. That Sean had caught it before 34 12, the season before. Yeah, spawned but, out. No, no, it, might, it might have been the season before that, actually, because I didn't fish it in yeah, 2000. Spawned out. Definitely a female, then, was it? Yeah. I think it, it was definitely, I think that it was definitely probably its, its normal weight, if you like, before it was spawn bound. Oh yeah, I mean yeah. I mean, um, they, it, go it, it was, down, they go up and down. They go up and down a lot, don't they? Yeah. Fish when they spawn, you know. It was a, yeah, and it was it was a naturally gutty fish as well. So that also maybe why it carried extra weight. Anyway, um, so moving forward a bit more, that Sean ended up catching it again at forty two. Um, oh right, he got caught five, over forty then, did it? Yeah, he got caught at forty two. Yeah, Sean had it. Um. He was putting loads of bait in. He's only a local lad, good angler. You know what I mean. A good, a good friend too. Um, he had it at forty-two. But in between him catching that, uh, there's another, there's another angler on there who fished it for a while. We had, we had a fair amount of good success on there. 
we we and him were, were talking about the certain fish that I've been seeing for a few years. Right, and I kid you not, like I, I'd wound in talking to him, and uh, I went back to my swim, and the swim where I was fishing, I spent most of my time looking in the backwater. Anyway, I, I thought I seen this fish in this backwater, and I, and I could count these like four scales on its side. And I rang him up. I said, Dave, Dave, I says, come around here. I think that fish you've been talking about, I think it's here. Anyway, <laughs> he come around like thinking, well, the next week is, he goes, that's the fish, that's the fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But honestly, yeah. honestly, it looked as big as the common. Mm, yeah. Anyway, so the common got caught. Um, this is where it all goes wrong now. The common got caught. Then the mirror got found dead. Right. Uh, me and that Sean, um, basically, we made a fire and burnt it. Mm. Um, it, it, was, it was over forty pounds. We, we lifted it up. Yeah. It, it, it hadn't been dead long. All its eggs were still. You know, when it, the eggs like like a golden orange. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the eggs inside it were perfect. It, it had it had been pecked at. And it wasn't. It was. It, its eyes were still. Its eyes hadn't gone. What you call it? Do you know what I mean? When they go that sort of, yeah, I can't, opaque. Yeah, yeah. Its eyes were still clear. Uh, I was gutted, honestly. And then, about four days after, the common was found dead. Jesus. Well, that, at that at that juncture, John, we'll just pause the meeting, uh, and then we'll come back on and talk about these PVA bags. Yeah. Right, and so. Right, so with the uh, with them fish dying, I was uh, I was wounded. I thought, um, I was obviously the year before I'd spent not work, working over, so uh, I, I was I was kicking myself for missing out on the opportunity. Obviously, you know the fish died through being spawn bound, um, and so the, the the effect there on me fishing is I just lost the bug. And uh, if we fast forward about three, four months till maybe, I think it was end of October, early November of that year, I just decided to go walks. And... Was that 2017? Yeah, yeah. Um... Anyway, I was, I was on auction. And then, oh, uh... so, you, so you'd always kept your orc ticket then, had you, John? Yeah. Yeah, because I had been fishing in the winter. I know we haven't, we haven't. Uh... Delved into hawks in the winter, but I, I had been having a few good winters. It, it, it got a good winter form from from probably 2009 onwards. It was a good winter water in terms of um, results, etc. Um, a lot of a lot, a lot of it was because of the the pioneers fish because everybody know you know everybody knows the place. It, the hawks and been hate to say this, but um, it said otters on there since probably nineteen ninety nine, maybe. Yeah. Um, I mean, anyway, bad, bad news, I, I, the otters. Bad yeah, news. I, I don't want to dwell on that. The only thing I would say is now it's on the up. Um, um, it's really doing well. It's just done a thirty in this last week. Yeah, they're, lo- uh, they're looking for members again now, aren't they? All? I mean, that was unheard of years ago. They were looking for members. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, mate. Um, within a few within a few years, that, that there'll be a waiting list because you know they're yeah. going in the right direction. It's, but the, the club spent years in the wilderness. The water quality wasn't very good. There was vast numbers of small fish in there, like missed generations of fish. If you know what I mean, it was just like stunted roach. There was yeah. algae in the water. Um, you know. The, Natural food was mainly probably just bloodworm, and to the, to the population of fish, maybe the the, the fish in the end needed boilies to uh, survive. I, I don't know. I'm not an expert, but you know, put that to one side. Part oh that, yeah, I mean, the, the cell text it, didn't they? Got rid of the load of cells in there. Yeah, well, they were putting hydrated lime in for a number of years, and then they put uh, that cell text in, and that made a host of difference. Um, I went to walk up there. Um, and that, with my mate Jamie, Jamie Downs, and uh, he, uh, 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 what was that? It was in COVID. It was in the COVID, the first COVID. Um, it, it wasn't a very good day in terms of uh, brightness, but you could see, you could see the bottom way out where the water used to be dead murky. Yeah. 
Yeah, you yeah. Know, so, it's always, always coloured water, wasn't it? Yeah, and, and again, I, again, I, I mean, for people who know auction, right, if somebody said to you or to me say, 10 years ago, we're going to put auto fence up, I'd laughed at them because the expenditure, it would have been out of this world, if you like, but, mm. but you know, fair play to the guys who were uh, running the place. They've uh, almost got it sorted now in terms of getting the, getting the fence up. You know, and it, are you it, joking? How so they're having an auto uh, fence, are they? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so, well, that's, know, good. It, that's good for the future then, isn't it? I mean, it's oh, a, mon- yeah. it's a yeah. monumental task at uh, constructing auto fence because it's a big, long lake, isn't it? It's a very long lake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and you think, I mean, well, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't tell you how many how many meters it would be, uh, or in terms of mileage to do well, to do a. It's got to be a mile long, anti talk. It's got to be a mile long. So you're talking a two mile fence at least, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. It's got to be. A, it's can't be far off a mile long. I mean, I've walked it a couple of times. It's a long way. Yeah. Yeah. And anyway, now like I say, it's thriving again. There's angles on there catching fish, um, and the fish are going to get bigger. Um, there's going to be a stocking policy. The game take some of the silvers out again, like some of the, the bream, etc., to yeah. make it into a proper yeah. cart water. Well, yeah, um, I mean, I've just seen that recent video what Simon Crow's done on there, and both of them look like young fish, and they were they were nice fish. They both of them, they're both twenties, nice fish. Where he caught, I was very yeah. surprised when he actually said that you know the club's looking for members, sort of thing. I mean, yeah, you know, in the nineties, the it was sort of you couldn't get in there, you know, no. No, <laughs> yeah, we've had this discussion in the past, haven't we? It yeah. depends on who, yeah. it was depending on who you knew wanted to, yeah, it was, yeah, it was, with, yeah. Uh, um, mm. like I say, but yeah, so you know, that place, yeah, you know, obviously, we have digressed on what we were talking about, but yeah, you know, Hawkston is on the up, um, and I'm so glad about it, like, well, that's good. I mean, well, yeah, it's a place what's close to your heart, isn't it, John? You spent long, hours oh, yeah, yeah, you, you love that. I mean, to yeah. be, I, I spent well from 1991 on and off until. Oh God, two thousand in twelve, maybe thirteen, fourteen. Having it as like a water, I didn't fish all the time. I mean, through the through the through the nineties, I fished all the time. I, I had a, quick, a few escapades off onto Cape Stone and fishing Wheel of Angling Society in the early two thousands, but I always managed to find my way back on auction. Yeah. yeah, I used to love it. I love it on there. I mean, you, you know, it's just so. Tranquil, then you know, it's yeah, it's, I mean, a, it's, a, it's a lovely place, it really is yeah. a lovely place. Well, I wasn't big fish orientated, so it didn't bother me. I'd just go there, chill out, fish, and then just what well, you know, that was that basically. So, so anyway, so so moving on, um, let's say the then two big fish died in that pit, and uh, I, I was wounded, honestly, in there. I think I went a good number of months before I fished again. And that happened to go, I think it was end of October or November. And this is like 2017. Um, and uh, just so happened that J- my mate Jamie was there, Jamie Downs. Like, and uh, we got chatting away. I used to fish with them for a bit, a bit um, in the in the mid-90s. And then he, he moved to Nottingham. And I hadn't seen him for years. Anyway, uh, he'd move back into the area, etc. And then, uh, you know, I, I, to, to be honest with you, I didn't, I, 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 I nearly didn't go. <laughs> then it sounds a bit daft. Do you know? Do you know it. something? Um, his name rings a bell. Yeah, he, he hasn't got a ticket for Black Lake, has he? No, no, no. Yeah, I'm sure there's somebody on there. I mean, I mean, that's standard. no. He, he's a Shropshire, He's a Shropshire lad. He's, he fishes the Mears in Shropshire. Yeah, um, no, it's a different. Anyway, like I say, I went there. I nearly didn't go. Um, I wasn't very keen. I hadn't been fishing for a few months, and uh, went there, set up, and that. Then I, I, I don't know. How I even realised where he was because he was only just a bit further up from me. Anyway, as paths crossed, if you like, and uh, we got chatting away in that, and then he said he was in the syndicate. Blah blah blah. And uh, I was saying to him, like, and basically, I, 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 I was almost done in carp fishing. I thought, after what had happened and where I was up to with me fishing, I thought, that's me uh, done now. Oh, yeah. it hit you that hard, had it? Yeah, well, it, it, it hit me hard. And 
hadn't been for a while. You know, it is. The, the, the less you go, the less you're inclined to want to go. Anyway, so anyway, we got chatting away, and uh, he said he was in the syndicate and where have you, and uh, and he put a word in for me, and uh, and ended up getting in. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. Yeah. fair play, like I owe him one because if he wasn't for that, I, I wouldn't be fishing. I know, I know, hundred percent. In two thousand eighteen, I would, I would not have, I would not have been fishing. Um, and that would probably been it. Um, anyway, so. So it gets on to this new syndicate. Um, um, fishing a few times, didn't catch anything. Been on a couple of times with Jamie, um, just you know, to, to introduce me to the place, etc. Um, I had go and uh, there, there was fish coming out and what have you. Um, it, it could come towards, I think it was coming towards east uh, to. To, to May at this point, fish started coming out. And uh, anyway, so what year is this then? 2017? This is 2018 now. 18, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, uh, I've got a couple of me- different methods. I think the thing is, well, you know, this is where there's like quite a few, you know, like where you're in comfort zones. I hadn't done any long range fishing for years. It, you know, to say it was 2018, um, the longest range I'd fished in, you know, apart from, obviously, there's no long range fish on auction. So, mate, oh, mate, I think eight, it was eight, on wheel. 80, 80 yards, max, any to auction. Yeah, yeah, but um, I think it was about in 2001 to 2003. I fished on, on some wheelock waters where I had to cast a bit. Uh, so it was a good few years since I'd uh, whack, been whacking a few legs. So that took me t- straight out of my comfort zone. And I'd, I'd, I'd obviously bought some new gear um, so I could cast. Um, so it was all like learning this, that and the other, and whatever, you know, finding my feet, blah, blah, blah. Um, anyway, so... Um, I was fishing. I was fishing. This, I started fishing like um, just like lead clips, and on one rod, I'd be using a solid bag, and the solid bag just consisted of pellets. It was nothing more than um, yeah, so. You, very, so your like basic the, bog, sta- bog standard solid bag then? Yeah. yeah, I was using that. What do you call it? That I said I'd been into angling direct up uh, Stoke in that one that bottom only, and uh, there was a hint in this ultimate PVA bag mix or something it was called. Got a mixture of different pellets in, so I started off using that. You know, added nothing to it, and uh, anyway, I was fishing this one particular weekend, and you know, it come to the last morning, and ended up uh, I hadn't had nothing out the lake um, up until this point, and they ended up having like two, two, two fish, and both of them were thirties, and um, I lost one as well, and, and all the fish, all the run, sorry came to this one particular method. Like, and by this time, the weed wasn't up ready. You know, so the weed was, so was that then? What was you caught on that, on the bags? Or? That, that was on the bags. So, I mean, so my other, my other rigs, I'm not saying the other rigs wouldn't have worked, but the, so the next week when I went there, I got three three solid bags. <laughs> I thought, well, I had three runs. You know, well, I had two fish and lost one and on one rod, and the other two haven't done anything. And, and I, it could sense that the weed was growing. So I thought, right, okay, I'll, I'll start using this. And and uh, so so basically from there on, um, I ended up having a, a few more fish in that sort of that sort of time period, moving into sort of into into July. Um, then I start then um, like I said to you before, I was like wading out. And in, in certain swims, because the water level was down, and I was looking around, and I'd seen where I could see where all the weed was flattened. Like, and nobody was bothering with these areas. <clears throat> and uh, I thought, some mileage in this, these have got to be fish doing this. Anyway, the next week, I bought a rake from home, and I put one of the, you know, you know, the, you know on your landing net, you had them, them things stopping that sinking. Oh, I yeah, put one of them on, yeah. Yeah, I put one of them on the end of my rake, so 
if it's, if it's, so it didn't sink into the water, if you know what I mean. So I took a rake out with me, raked, raked, raked swims, well, not raked swims, raked a swim where where basically the weed had been flattened and they could see like tunnels in the weed. They looked like tunnels in the weed. I mean, without putting a, a diving mask on and dipping me under the water, but it got polarised glass, but I could see what I could see. Anyway, so I cleared all this area out, put a load of bait in, walked out, I put like a marker float on a, on a lead so I could know where I was walking to. And then I walked out, looking, dropped solid bags there, fall, you know, walked back, I thought... I'm in here, I'm having these here, you know what I mean? But these come here tonight or whatever. Anyway, the next two weeks, nothing happened. I thought, right, that's it, I'm not bothering with this area. Anyway, so I started, and then I started like moving around other areas. Like, and then I realised there wasn't as much weed. And um, and by this time as well, I was obviously with a bit of my bait knowledge. And what I, what I forgot to mention um, previously is when I was on that other pit at Body Moore East, I was actually making a paste bait. Um, but the paste bait was basically not, not, not the bait we was using. I, I'd actually, I was actually using their bait works Atlantic Heat, uh, their boilies. And um, I made it like a supplementary paste of me. Of, um, you'll, you'll know this. You know, you know Pete B? Yeah, yeah, you've told me before. Yeah, Pete B's well, mix, yeah. yeah. Well, the Pete B's mix, which was basically... Um, LT ninety four. Oh yeah, it's it's a standard yeah. fish meal with balakan in it. So, you know, yeah, yeah, that's all yeah, you need. Yeah. At the end of the yeah. day, bait gets a little bit too complicated for some people, but that's uh, yeah. the standard mix where it catches plenty of fish. Yeah. So I, I added on. <clears> I added on to this. I added on to this mix. So I got ingredients. This is this is where I'm sort of coming from. I got like a boat like LT ninety four, CPSP ninety. Um, at the time, I was using hydrolyzed whey. Yeah. Um, whey protein concentrates. Yeah, well, I mean, which, you yeah. know, I mean, that's the only, you know, like I say, Pete B's mix was a bog standard mix, but, you know, your ingredients yeah. like your pre digested fish meal that you're using in your whey. Yeah, yeah. Your I'll, I'll take it to another level, won't I? Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, the. But, but it was a paste, though. It wasn't far, boiling. Yeah, I mean, but they're far better ingredients than what's in that bait. You know, they're far yeah, better yeah, yeah. as regards attraction. As regards attraction. Anyway, so without going too far backwards, I got I got ingredients, and um, and also, um, I think I think you can remember. Remember, can remember the, what they used to call the Black Forum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was sort of. Uh, a silent member on there, if you like, and I, I'd have the odds. I'd have the odds little, the uh, post or whatever, and I was. I used to talk to, to, to people on messages and stuff. Um. Anyway, there was this guy, um, he's from Norfolk way. I used to have a lot doing. His name was Ian. Um. Oh, uh, he was in his seventies. He was mad oh, on base. Yeah, Butterbean. Butterbean. That's him. I, do you know what? I couldn't think of his name. Yeah. Uh. Anyway. He put me on to this Pepta Pro. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, which is hydrolyzed casein. Hydrolyzed casein, yeah, and it's not cheap. Um, oh, no, I mean, it was even back then, it was about 30 quid a kilo. It's even more now. Well, well it was more than that. Um, we, were look, we looked the other week, I was showing my mate when I was on the syndicate like, the other week. So cause I, I, I got like a pot of it in my PVA bucket, just like, you know, if I need to add, add it like because it's not it's not a good thing to add because it's sticky, so you have to oh, be very well, careful. Well, it will be if it's hydrolyzed, mate. Yeah. It'll be super solid. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I know. Um, so, so anyway, so as they evolved with these solid bags, obviously, what what I'd gained from the, the investigations into this, that, and the other regarding bait ingredients, etc. Getting the you wanting the best of, of, of attraction from an, an, an amino acid perspective. Um, you know, things like Pepta Pro are, are up there, CPSB90, uh, even go as far as, you know, I mean, I, I know you've got your views on yeasts, but I, I used to get uh, my autolyzed yeast from British Bee Feeds. Yeah. Um, and it, it was it was a different beast than uh, the stuff you get from the proprietary companies. 
it was, I think I paid, what was it now? I think I paid 20 quid for 500 grams. Yeah, super uh, expensive. Yeah. But, then. Super expensive. But, but it's in a bag. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not making bait. It's, yeah, in, a, yeah. it's in a solid bag. It's in a solid yeah. bag mix. So you, 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 the turnover isn't that great, if you like. Mm. And uh, also, uh, I was using um, human grade uh, beef liver powder as well. Yeah, which well, is a good um, ingredient. It's a good ingredient. Yeah, that's basically obviously got an amino acid profile, but it's got a good taste. A good taste profile well, it's, all, as well. it's also the nucleotide contents. I mean, you know, yeah. yeasts and yeasts and liver powder. There's massive nucleotide content there, and that's they're massively attractive to carp. Yeah, yeah. And then if you're using hydrolyzed casein as well, then you know you're making a bomb, mate. You're making a carp bomb. You know they're, they're going to love that, mate. They're going to love that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so um, also as well, I, I was using the. Different cheese powders as well. Um, I can't remember which types now, but that was only for a short period of time. But that that period of time did coincide with the build up to the 2018 winter, if you like. Now, in terms of difference, did it make? I don't know because at the time, um, uh, is that how many ideas going through me head? You know what I mean? And obviously, whatever I was doing was controlled. I had, I had actually wrote, written it down. I didn't like yeah. just put stuff in my mix and, and like just like a teaspoon of this, this, that, and the other. Well, yeah, I, I mean, it. I know that. That's why I've made a point about stressing that I think these bags were instrumental in the captures that you had, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, and, and so, say for it, so, right, so in terms of what I did, in terms of making my bag mix, um, so, you know, hydrolysates is like the, the new buzzword in carp fish, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, they are good. It, I mean, I've got my own opinion on them, but they are good, but there's various other things that you can but use. The, 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 thing, the thing with the hydrolysate is it, it depends, um, how can I say, if it's, if it's that based on a species, you're okay. But say, say for example, do you know, like, basic fish hydrolysates where there's no specific species attached to it the actual makeup of them is done on a ship right and and basically what happens is is all the all the all the species that nobody wants are put into a vat isopropanol's added to take the fat away and then and then then, then basically the setup for enzymatic hydrolysis which is basically creating the, the the right temperature, the right pH to make the enzymes active. Yeah, I mean they add the enzymes, add the fish, and bump, and then they make they making a, a fish hydrolysate. The thing is, that particular fish hydrolysate is more defined and destined for the agricultural market. Yeah. Um. Anything. Anything that's like your, your tuna, salmon, you know. I mean, I mean, I'm not a plugging. I'm not plugging. Um, but that Bacchanal Express, um, I've been using for years now. That that their their ingredients are controlled. Yeah, Sorry, I mean, the, product... I mean the, the the top end hydrolysates like you know exactly what the traceability of them is. Yeah, yeah, and we say with Bacchanal Express. I'm not. I'm not dissing other 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 companies here. I'm just purely concentrating on Bacchanal Express. You get a data sheet, a scientific data sheet yeah. that goes into the molecular structure in terms of. Um, I can't think of the word now. Well, it gives you a breakdown of the amino acid profile and the hydrolysis, the, how far it's hydrol it, it, hydrolyzed. It, 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 it basically tells you how small the molecules are. I can't, yeah. What's, the, what, yeah, yeah. what's it called? I can't think of the word. Yeah, it tells you the degree of hydrolysis. Yeah. Yeah, so so um and so what I used in the, my my palate mix is what's available on Bacquerel Express. Uh, which was the tuna. Yeah. The salmigo. Yeah. And the shrimp. Now the tuna salmigo, they're human grade as well. Yeah. Um the the the, the shrimp is disgusting. Yeah, no, uh, I do. I, 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 do use, I do use that, John. Yeah, I mean, it's not the best. Yeah. 
<laughs> I, I think I'd rather get shit on my fingers than that. Yeah, yeah. And that's not, and that's not exaggerating, honestly. Anyway, so I, I but so at thirty three percent, the the tuna, the uh, salmigo, and the shrimp. Uh, the shrimp is something like twenty percent protein, and it's hydro hydrolyzed. Um, I think it's like eighty percent, which. Oh god, that's a bit what. But on the other two, they have something like eighty percent protein, but the de the, de the degree of hydrolysis is at around twenty percent. Yeah. Um, so it's it's like a good mixture of of different um molecular you know, different amino acids. Yeah, I mean you, you know, you've got uh, you've got a massive range there of different degrees of hydrolysis. So. You know you're going to be getting free amino acids, peptides, and these hydrolysates are good. But I've got my opinion on different things. And well, I'll, I'll, I have two. And so, so originally when I used to, you know, say make a spod mix, I tip, I tip some some of my pellets. You know, say you got like a couple of kilos of pellets. Tip a good glug of the mixture in the pellets. Mix it up, let it soak in. They're mixed in the spod mix, and um, I was using that, and you know, I was I wasn't unsuccessful, but and this is like influence from what other people other people. This is you, you you can remember this is getting back to the black forum, Chem Seven, can't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 His yeah. name was Mystic on the other forum. Mm -hmm. Well, he said to me, he said, he said. By doing what you're doing, because you know, we were having private messages, open conversation, is by doing what you're doing, you're basically un um, risking uh, in your swim or in the water um, amino acid saturation. Yeah. So, so and it, it basically, I mean, a carp swims around in a lake and everything, uh, water um, is. Well, that's, well, their, obviously. That, that's their medium of communication, mate. That's their yeah, yeah, yeah. So, communication. so if you imagine like um, something that with the the strength of a sniffer dog swimming around in the water, it's picking up amino acids anyway, isn't it? Yeah. All the signatures of whatever is on the bottom, or this, anything rotting on the bottom, blah, you know, etc., etc. Well, that's but, how they that's how they find the natural food, mate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but the. the but with the taking this on board, I thought I'm going to stop doing that. I thought I'm going to add it just into my bag mix. And so what I did, I started sort of basically just say if I've got like a, a basic average size sandwich box, I'd like put a mixture of pallets in there. I put them, um, what do you call them, in this ultimate PVA bag mix, 50 50 with the uh, Sticky baits, two point three mil blood room pellets. Yeah, mix them up. And then what I do is I get a mixture of the hydrolysates, and I, I just tip tip some into the into the box with the pellets. Mix it up so the pellets were wet. And then put the lid back on. Leave it twenty four hours, and then the next day, I um, go to the pellets, and they were all sort of odd because everything's just gone. Stiff and soaked everything up, break them all back up again, and everything went back to pellets again. What I'd do then is I'd add the same amount of liquid just to wet the pellets. What I'd do, I'd add, I'd add CPSB ninety. Yeah, super. Um, I mean, I mean, I can't stress how good of an ingredient that actually is. Oh yeah, no, this, I know what is, I mean. this is why, this is why I've got my reservations about people having. Um, massive confidence in hydrolysates in boily formulas. This is because yeah. that's you know that ingredient is superb. You can't get better yeah. than that from a traction it, point of view. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so, so what I'd do is I'd I'd add CPSP. Now, well, what what I'd do is I'd mix I'd mix the ingredients, the powders together first before adding them to the pellets. Sorry, I forgot about that. So, in a, in a, in a control fashion. I so, like get like an old pop up tub and put say three three teaspoons of CPSP ninety, three teaspoons of um Pepto Pro, three teaspoons of beef of beef liver powder, three teaspoons of autolyzed yeast. Mix them all up, 
they are all very high, highly soluble ingredients. Oh, they? yeah, yeah, super, right. super soluble. Right, so, and this is by accident. This is not design. This is by accident what happened. I'm going to tell you now, right? So, imagine I've wetted the pellets again. Tip the powders in, mix the powder. Oh, shake the, shake the tub so all the powders are mixed. And then add them, add them to the pellets. And when you start mixing the pellets in, you, know you, you get small pastelets. I call them pastelets. <laughs> Basically because the ingredients are so sticky and they're mixing with liquid, they're forming little, little tiny little tiny balls. They're not, they're not balls. They're little, like, like, like one mil, two mil. Like of of, of um, like I can say I, I call them pastelets, and you just mix, as you mix in your pallets with the powder, that's that's they're all in between the pallets themselves. So then you put the lid back on, leave it the next day, and then the day after that you go back, you know, leave it twenty four hours, and back in there, and basically the pallets again because the pallets can suck up some liquids, can't they? Mm. Even if they're small, they've sucked all the liquid in. And all the pacelets are all are all there, physically there. So imagine putting all that in a solid bag. And in the in, in, in the in the massive big benefit of all that is the animal boiled. And you've Correct. got everything there. Correct. And, and mm. also, so the main the, so when I'm baiting, so from so well, for so at this particular time, I was catching quite a few fish, like getting there early in the morning. Chucking out and having fish quick, yeah. Like, and so it stands to reason, doesn't it? Oh, you've created a time bomb, haven't you? I mean, everything there yeah. that you're mixing up together in the bag, it's all super oh. attractive. So, yeah, but you, you can't I, was avoiding, I, was, I was avoiding amino acid saturation. Well, everything, I, I'm, uh, not, I'm, not, bit... I'm not, I'm not too sure about that, John, to be quite honest. No, 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 right. So Let's go back to what I was on about before. If you mix it all your pallets and your spod mix and cast out, what's going to happen? It's, oh. it's like saying, right, get get twenty bloodhounds and, and get and get uh, twenty or thirty things that you want them to find. Rub it all around on the grass. Right, guys, go and have a look. What are they going to be doing? They're going to be searching, aren't they? Because it's all you know, all the all the signature. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, but I'm still but, not entirely sure that what he's told you is absolute fact, to be quite honest with you. I mean, you're using things that are very attractive to carp, um, you know, and it doesn't really matter whether you're using them straight away or whether it's the night before because you've got your pallets while they're soaking it all in. So you don't really get... In my personal opinion, you, you won't really get an amino acid saturation because if if he's if he's trying to say you gain amino acid saturation, then you'll get that just from using CPSB ninety. You know. So yeah, but what I'm saying to you, Dean, is, is everything that was soaked is only in the bag. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no, 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 I know what you're saying. Yeah, all the free offerings, i.e., pellets, particles, chop boilies, etc. I never added any. I used to do. And I stopped. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they've got yeah. their own, they've got their own attract, you know, old faction and gustry um, qualities themselves. Anyway, aren't they? Whereas, yeah. Where yeah. there's the solid bag that is pumping. Yeah, you but that's I mean? that's the. I mean, but I mean, at the end of the day, though, you've exploited that as being the focal point of the fish drawing down onto that area, and that's what you're catching on. So, I mean. Really, you could say you you're saturating them with that, but you weren't really because that isn't what's ha what's happening at all. So you were just yeah. doing what you were doing, and it was working, uh, and that's the the focal point. Because I mean, that's the that's an important point in fishing. You have to create the focal point for the hook bait. I mean, it's not something that I always do in my fishing, but it, it can work and it can be massively effective. Yeah, and also, um, I did. I did I mean, do you, do you remember that rig that Steve Renyard used to use, the hermit rig? Hermit rig, yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 where, where I fish, you have to lose the lead. So the hermit rig, in the way the, the mechanics were. Oh, well, you couldn't Renyard, do it then, could you? Because he doesn't lose. No, the no, lead no. But, but, but I, I found a way that I could do it with releasing the lead. 
in the yeah, two I, I think I think you could do it with with still having really a drop off lad. Yeah, I, I did, I think I, you could. I think I'll, I'll I'll have to send you that to show you. Um, I've got like little videos. Um, uh, of uh, of obviously of, of, of in action on my dinner table, not like in the lake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. But um, also in, in mucking around with uh, that sort of stuff. I mean, I haven't used it in anger, but I sent you a, a video of, of that that PVA bag and that bucket, didn't I? Oh yeah, I saw that, mate. That was that was massively active. That was insane. Yeah. Do you know what that was? No, but it was good. It was active. <laughs> I tell you what, I tell you what. Right, I've shown this to a few people, but I've never, I've never used it in anger, for the simple reason, is is holding the components down because they float would be quite hard. And basically, I'll tell you what it is. Right, you, you can put that up. You, you can put that on YouTube if you want, mate. I, I've never put it on YouTube. I've shown it to a few people, but I've never put it on YouTube or anything like that. Basically, do you know um, the ingredients for bath bombs? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. By, by carbonate of soda and citric acid. 50-50, mm. mixed with an oil. Yeah, well, have you used have you used that in your own fishing, like in quarter ones? No, I've not used it in anger, except both, but from a pH point of view. Um, well, I mean, you, well, you can't beat citric acid, mate. It's one of the greatest well, additives ever invented. Well, citric acid is, is three, and by carbonate of soda is eight on the old pH scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Totally different. Yeah, totally different on the pH. Because I, I, I'll be honest with you, I was worried. I was worried about um, obviously too much citric acid becomes. Uh, yeah, it can put it can put them off, mate. But yeah, I mean, yeah. I've got loads of findings about citric acid. Like, I won't talk about them now. But yeah, I mean, I mean, some of the. Some of the quantities about citric acid that you'll read about on the internet from people like that chem and whatever, uh, they're not right, to be quite honest with you. Because well, I can prove they're not right because I saw Luke to catch a lot of fish and yeah. they don't they don't use citric acid at the same levels that they tell everybody you can only use, Matt. No, I mean in in terms of citric acid, I I, I mean I've never done any experiments. All I've all that I can ever go on is. You know, is what other people say to me, and obviously I've got I've got the direction of what you've done or said with the Carp Angles Chronicles guys, Sam and yeah. Pete. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't give everything away on there, mate. I mean, oh no, he didn't. You know, Sam, <laughs> Sam was pushing me like saying so citric acid at one gram, and I was going, well, yeah, you'll you'll get away with one gram, but that's not the levels that I use, mate. <laughs> you know. I mean, yeah, I'm not going to tell everybody what I, I'm not going to tell everybody what I do because I do this for a living. So, yeah. and I'll be honest with you, them super orange match the actual pop ups that I sell. I'd like a pound for every fish they've caught, mate. And they which ones them? Super orange, the match the actual pop ups, the super orange. Uh, right. I'd like a pound for every fish they've caught, mate, because they've caught a lot of fish and they catch loads of fish from everywhere. Um. And I don't use citric acid at one gram per egg in them, mate. But you can get away with one gram, like I mean, won't do you no harm if you use one gram. But I'm not going to tell everybody what I use. That. So, so when you're saying this, I'm not, I'm not like asking you for any of the answers. But the fear that one of the things that's just come to my head: the fish is not eating the pop-up, is it? No, they're not eating it. No, no, they're definitely not so, eating so, it. So, 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 so you can cancel out gustatory, gustatory, can't you? Well, it's no, I mean, I mean, the the gustation is probably the most important part of any eat bait. Yes, but, I know, but but they're not eating it, are they? No, they're not eating it. No, I mean, but they taste it, mate. As soon as soon as a carp gets within six inches of anything, it tastes. Oh God, yeah, yeah. I mean, you go even, you know, depends on the on the release, doesn't it? Yeah, um, I mean, a, a, a carp can taste something from six inches away. There's no two ways about it. Oh, oh yeah, I I think um, they can sense things from a lot further away. I, oh I yeah, def them. oh definitely, definitely. I mean, um, caught, I mean, I'm hundred percent convinced that um, a liquid flavour will attract a carp from at least fifteen feet away, at least. What what do you what do you what are your thoughts on um, this uh, diffusion in oil? Not 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 essential oil. 
I know your thoughts on essential oil. I'm on about normal oil, where certain bait companies sell products on the very basis of the oil rising up in the water column, taking up items of either flavour or food, liquids, and dispersing. And what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, we'll come back to that in a second, because I'm just going to pause the meeting there, and then we'll come back to it. All right. All right. Yeah, to be honest with you, John, um, I think oils and, and bait is well. It's 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 misunderstood by some people, but using oils in your bait is a, a definitely a very good way of uh, dispersing the food signals. Because, as you know, although a carp can't detect uh, a pure oil, the amino acid fragments and the nucleotides and even the liquid flavors and essential oils, etc., what rise up out of your bait is is an excellent way of dispersing the food signals. I mean, there's a few companies now who are selling these oil-based liquids mixed with hydrolysates, and I'll be honest with you, I've been doing that for four years. I've got a, a liquid there called shrimp oil, um, and it's I use the, the Baccarat shrimp hydrolysate that you spoke about now. I didn't used to. I used to make my own hydrolysate, but it was a little bit prone to carrying on fermenting and stuff, so I've had to swap to that. But it's not just the shrimp hydrolysate from Baccarat. It's a mixture of a few things in an oil. So yeah, I mean, oils is a, a good way of dispersing the food signals, you know, because it'll it'll spread through the water column. I don't use oils in every bait though; I only use them in fish meals. Um, but yeah, so let's go back to this amino acid saturation thing that you were speaking about when you said somebody had informed you that you could have been getting an amino acid saturation. Because I'll be honest with you, uh, I'll let you have a little chat about it, but then I'll come back at you with a few things because. It's quite misleading because there's there's a lot of factors. Uh, you've got to remember all these studies about amino acid saturation. They're done in confined environments, and a lake's not a confined environment. It's a totally different thing, in my opinion. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, where, where the angle that I was coming from was, say, for example, you say you got like two or three kilos of pellets that you soaked, pre-soaked throughout the week. Um, and an hydrolysate, etc. And then, so they are loaded then, aren't they? So yeah. they get spotted out into the lake. Then, you know, be whatever whatever bait you're using, bait whatever, gets cast amongst them. Um, the way where I was coming from, from a saturation point of view, was, uh, from, you know, where the carp detects the uh, amino acids, it isn't basically pointing straight at your bait. Yeah. Uh, whereas, say, for example, if you didn't, um, add the hydrolysates beforehand. And, and I know everything's got its own label in terms of being able to be identified by the car, but not being sort of accelerated, if you like. The only acceleration of attraction would be, say, in the hook bait or the uh, PVA bag, for example. Yeah, I know, I know where you're coming from. And, and amino acid saturation is a phenomenon, you know, and it can happen. But you've got to remember, uh, I mean, there's a thing called a uh, dissociation constant. So, so I mean, it's a dynamic situation. When, when a carp binds an amino acid to its receptors, um, and when they talk about saturation, I think, they, I think they're referring to more than 30% of the receptors being occupied at any one time. Um, but you've got to remember, because that's a dynamic situation, uh, when the carp moves away or swims around or whatever, those those molecules aren't staying there, so they can be flushed clean. They can be flushed clean, so it can all change. And and the thing the thing is as well, um, I think it was Ari Askell. Do you know you know who he is, don't you? Yeah, I remember who he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he used to do a lot yeah. of articles and stuff. Um, yeah, because he's done a few groundbreaking things. I think some of his work is in the the BCSG books, uh, but I haven't got any of them. I think one of my mates has got the one. What I'd need to reference. But he did some work on uh, amino acid concentrations around various food items in a lake. And you'll be amazed to find out that it's very difficult to even overcome the background noise. So, you know, you've already got amino acids in the water and nucleotides and various things from the, the natural food and the weed and yeah. stuff. Uh, so it's, it's a lot more difficult than what you think to actually create a massive hotspot of, of attraction in a lake because of the way the water moves and all the different factors. But, I mean, it is a phenomenon. There's no two ways about it, what you've said. It is a phenomenon. It can happen. 
But I'll be totally honest with you, personally speaking, from a practical fishing point of view, I don't think it's something that's ever going to happen. I mean, I don't, the reason why I don't think it really happens is because I've used hydraulic seats, uh, well, similar sort of things, uh, ones that I've made myself and stuff, um, and spob mixes. Um, and you get... On runs waters, you can get you get an instantaneous reaction, and it's and it's in the water in that area because it's quick. It must be flooded with the attraction, and, and it doesn't seem to end the fishing. In fact, it helps it. Um, so there's lots of anecdotal evidence that I can think of where I personally don't think it really is a problematic scenario for you. I mean, I know you said that you were blanking a few times when you were putting bait in, and then you stopped putting bait in, and you were catching. But well, that can just be down to the time of year and stuff, can't it? You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all all, all I was like trying to impl imply was for the the attraction that was in that say that solid bag, for example, yeah. albeit um, you know the actual you got your solid bag and obviously you've got your bait that's in the bag as well, the hoop baits, which again push out attraction if. If there's any sort of accelerated attraction from like uh, yeah, you, amino acids, I, I know what you're saying. You, you're trying to you're trying to maximise the focal point of the bag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's um, yeah, but I mean, it's like the, the, the best out kid scenario. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But if you think about it as well, though, when you're talking about this saturation phenomenon with a bag and the nature of the the beast, what you've created, technically speaking, you could still get an amino acid saturation around that general area in the immediate locality of that bag if you thought it was happening because of the things that you're putting into the bag. Yeah. Well, my, my general consensus or my thought what well, is if it's in the immediate um, location of the bag, then that's obviously the fish have got more chance of homing in on it. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. If, if they're saturated, then it dumbs down the response. So basically, rather than getting a feeding response, in theory, with a saturated situation, it's it nullifies the reaction, and that's what that's basically what amino acid saturation or receptor saturation does. It it sort of sends the receptors from being responsive to it to completely unresponsive to the stimulus. You know, I mean, yeah, that, yeah. You know, the, the guys who you spoke to on that black forum, as knowledgeable as they are about different things, um, they don't know everything about everything because I mean, they don't know a lot about amino uh, essential oils and. Um, you know, I've seen them quoting figures for citric acid, like we spoke about before, and I I can prove to them that both things. I mean, like I say, citric acid without giving any secrets away, you can use it way higher than what people think. And essential oils unequivocally attract carp. You know, and it's a fact that any essential oil with the carboxylic acid, an ester or a phenol will attract carp. You know, and that's from an attraction point of view because I think other essential oils don't necessarily work solely on attraction. I think black pepper's one where I think there's other factors involved in the success of it. So yeah. But yeah, yeah. I think uh, yeah, I think with black pepper, I mean yeah, yeah essentially oils are used usually in combination with other things. But I think um black pepper essential oil, uh but with what of a better word, it'll synergize with a, with another flavour. And also it's of it uh, affects the metabolism of the fish potentially as well, do not it? Exactly, John. You've hit, the, you've hit the nail on the head there, John. That's exactly why I think black pepper is an effective additive in winter. It's got th it's got thermogenic properties, and I've always found that anything with thermogenic properties is generally good in the winter. And I use a couple of things in my baits with thermogenic properties, and the baits are very good catches when it's cold. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, so, so now you've told everybody about these bags that you're creating, and I'll be honest with you, I'm uh, I'm going to say something now, and it is a massive coincidence. Round about the same time that you, that you were doing all this, I was creating my Fermenzyme powder, which, uh, like I say, I don't want this to be a sales pitch or anything, but it's not a million miles away from what you were doing, John, and I was employing it in similar ways, sticks and bags and stuff. So it's it is actually a massive coincidence, but yours was slightly different, but... You know, it's a very, very similar train of thought that we both got onto there. Very similar. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I haven't had the successes you've had on it. I have caught quite a few fish on it, and I have had some big fish using it. I had a 30 one week from Pride when I was on a gas session, and that was the only 30 out all week. Uh, and I had that on one of these bags with this for Menzyme in. 
Um, so yeah, but so so just give us a recap now about the ingredients you're putting in the bags, and then we'll move on to some of the successes you had with it because I know that in the end, this really was a superb method for you. Yeah, so <clears throat> without going into the method of uh, mixing the hard roller seats, I'll just go into what was added. Um, and so, um, so CPSP90, yeah, uh, whey protein concentrate, um, hydrolyzed casein, which comes in the form of um, Pepto Pro, uh, LT94, um, autolyzed yeast, which um, I think was which I think was probably instrumental in the effectiveness of them. Be honest with you, because I've got massive, I rate yeast massively. Yeah, human grade liver powder. Yeah, another good I mean, <clears throat> They weren't all in at the same time. This is like through evolution. What it, what it amounted to in the end was uh, LT94, Pepto Pro, Autolyze Yeast, and CPSB90. And then the hydro, just to recap on the hydrolysates, <clears throat> they were all from Baccarel Express. Um, it was their tuna, their salmigo, and their shrimp. Yeah. Uh, 33% of each. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which turned out to be pretty good because the shrimp was quite thin, which uh, <clears throat> with the other two, the, 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 the salmon yeah, that, is that tuna is like that tuna is like paste, isn't it? Yeah, the tuna is quite thick, and so all in all, the, all all the three got together, and then they were <clears throat> they, could, they could sink efficiently into the pallets. You didn't like drown them in it; you yeah. just soaked them and then give them twenty four hours to take it on board, and then twenty after that twenty four hours, wet them again. Like I said, the, just to recap, a mixture of the and then powders I just mentioned um, were all added in equal parts, say 25% each if there was four parts added, and then uh, tipped in, teaspooned into the pallets and stirred in. And then you got, like, like I said before, these little pacelets. Yeah, the pacelets, yeah, yeah. You and uh, there yeah, was maximum solubility. Yeah, I mean, and, I, th you know, I think as well, like, I referred to it like as a, as a, a time bomb, a cart bomb. And it is really because... You know how you've done it, and the nature of the beast. It's a, uh, it's a very, it's it's a prolonged release. It's a prolonged release, really, uh, from from your trap. I mean, I know it, everything's soluble, but you've got things in there that are breaking down at different rates, haven't you? Yeah, and and say say moving into the winter of the first couple of years, I fished on there. Um, I was casting out. Uh, so you're getting there for half eight in the morning. Uh, casting out around about nine in the morning, and I was I was I was leaving the bait <clears> out. Just you know, hopefully I got a perfect cast straight away onto the area, and I'd leave that until I went home on on the Sunday. Mm. Yeah, I got on the Friday, forty eight hours later, Sunday dinner time. Yeah. Um. So, like you say, um, this, it's got it's got constantly giving off for that period of time. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, there's a single loop bait there, and also the the PVA bag rig. I don't think you can get much more of an efficient rig either. The sure two clink on a no, heavy def lead. Definitely not. Definitely not. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so, um, so that, that's that in a nutshell. I mean, in terms of catch rates, I mean, throughout the year when I saw when I, as I was evolving into this method, um, it'd be around about September of the first year. Um, I was like, I was, I was catching consistently September, October. Yeah, I think November might have been a bit light until, until towards the end. Then it started catching in December and into mid January. Um, I wasn't, I didn't do so well in the February that year, but the year, the year after, I was employing the bags obviously because I'd evolved by then in, in, in the summer fishing. And basically, I was getting there early, trying to cast out on spots that I knew at first light, just a single, just a single solid bag on a spot. And, and say if we cast that out at first light, say, say be say five o'clock in the morning, for example, at a certain time in the summer, um, I wouldn't touch that until probably three in the afternoon. In mm. which case, then I'd probably rewind and put some bait on, you know, and then set set a, a bit of a bait and weight trap. Sometimes fish shot three three on a spot. Yeah, that type of fishing. Um, and then sort of moving into that, that other winter, didn't catch as many uh, that winter. Um. But obviously the, the quality of the fish. Just just to recap, I think that first couple of years I had uh, 
So if you can, if you can count the first two years, I think I had um, uh, 26 fish over £30. Pounds. Yeah, which is good going. Of, of which six were over 40. Yeah, I mean, and you, and you, were ca and you caught quite a few of these big fish in the winter, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Well, the the, the bigger ones did, did come in the winter. Um, you know, January, December, January, um, early March. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, for the for the locality, the area, you know, the Midlands, in the time of year, can't really get any better than that, can you? The captures that you had. Yeah, no, no, and, and also in that in them first couple of years as well. Um, you know, say the first year, I, I, I'd almost got the the lake to myself in the winter. Yeah, apart which is... from my mate Gary, who, who came every other week, so to speak. I didn't got, I didn't got no winter form then, John. Everyone just jacked in because we got <clears> no winter form. I think I think the general belief was was sort of after sort of the end of September, it just goes slow. Yeah. Um, yeah. And my my thoughts were, well, I draw the blank fishing there, and then, then go other waters and catch twenties. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, uh, that was my drive. As the um, saying thought, goes, mate, you got to be in it to win it. Yeah. You know, um, I just kept to what I was doing. Like I said, I didn't, I didn't pre-bait. I did fish sometimes over bait unsuccessfully. Yeah. Whether that could be classed as pre-baiting for the next week, I don't know, because obviously I was fishing the same spots more same or less. Same spots, but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, def it's definitely um, having, a, having a bearing on it, isn't it? 100%. Yeah, there was, there was a, I mean... There was a, a, a population of small roach in there, which has got a bit more. There's a bit more of, you know, quite a few more of them nowadays. Yeah, I don't think they. I don't think they had much of an effect on the bags then. Um, you know, in terms of yeah, I mean, you know, eating, eating all the bits and bobs in the in the bag. Even small fish though, they slow down half a lot, don't they? Once the water goes cold. Yeah, well, one of the swims I fished at night time, uh, if we shone the torch in the margin. Um, you could see the roach just sitting there, like because one of the, the swims that are fished was a bit of um, a roundup area for the pike as well. Um, and I, I drop, I drop pallets down like a, sometimes just like make a mock bag and drop it down, and then you get going to it every few hours in, in the evening. Do you know what I mean? Or well, obviously they, I didn't sit there watching watch it all night, but in the morning I look at it, and in the hardly ever we seen anything gone. Yeah, um, yeah. So it gives so, you some indication of what's going out in the pond, then, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously that's a bit different now because there's a couple of different sorts of. It's a few, it's a few years have passed now when, um, say the the population. Oh, the roach seems the ones to have that, that, proliferated yeah, a bit more, do they? Yeah, they see the ones that probably were like three inches in that previous winter might be about eight inches now. <laughs> you know, and there's ones yeah. coming in between. But there's a higher population of roach, which. In effect, you know, does have an effect on uh, when people are baiting up. Yeah, definitely. Uh, whatever, they, whatever they're using. And that Especially when the are, water's warm. People, people would be amazed at how much bait nuisance fish can eat when the water's warm. Yeah. It, it's amazing also how much of an effect of, on the biomass they have. The general yeah. biomass. You know, yeah. take, take away what we put in. They take a lot of the natural food out of the lake. Yeah. Collectively. They take a lot of the oxygen out of the lake collectively. And they uh, pollute the lake collectively oh, with yeah, all cause, the because they're passing the rubbish out, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so 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 did you have two fish over forty five pound then on these bags? Yeah. So and, you had a forty six uh, and a forty seven. Forty six and a forty seven. Yeah. Both uh, common. Both commons. No, yeah, one of them was a mirror, and one was a common. I had a forty two common. Sorry, a forty two mirror. Middle of January. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the stuff of dreams, isn't it? Catches like that in, 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 in the proper winter months. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it is. Um, couldn't believe, I couldn't believe it, you know, from where, from where I was the year before, thinking of packing and fishing. Yeah, with the disaster were, what happened you know, on the other pit, yeah. Yeah, that disastrous, uh, well, the two, de the two deaths on that that little small pit, and then obviously the one before that on Cat, the one they called the twin had died, so that sort of forced me on to go back onto that one. Um, near Body Maurice, and then within a couple of months, the two biggest fish in there were dead. Yeah, um, yeah, and so yeah, you know, don't uh... labour on that. But fast forwarding, uh, yeah, I was I couldn't believe my luck where I was and what I was doing.
Yeah. I couldn't wait to get there every week. So si- since this period then, um, have you still been using these bags? Well, what, what happened is over the last couple of years, and we've, we spoke about this previously in this uh, podcast, is um, I don't think, although although put a solid bag, you, can, you know, people say you can cast it anywhere. Um, you know, when you've got your reservations, because you've said you've caught bottom baits in it, but the silt weed can be a problem. Yeah, it depends um, on the depth, move. I think. Depends on there's the depth. Of, I mean, silt weed can silt. get quite thick. Yeah, there's a lot of undertow as well. I mean, early, early spring, when it's coming, when it's flourishing, um, you know, and you get a few strong winds, it's a bit, you know, you think about what's going on, especially undertows as well. Yeah. You know, it could be covering you over. You know, it could oh, cover yeah, if, any of it. If it's, if it's wrong moving way. around, yeah, if it's moving around. Um, so, I mean, I... I, I Sort of opted then to sort of fish um, like a stiff hinge, but on a supple hook link, if you like, like a quite yeah, long hook link. A stiff, a stiff, a, 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 a supple boom uh, sort of thing. Yeah, a bit more, a bit more conspicuous, but at least you're fishing a bit, aren't you? Rather than sitting yeah, there yeah. thinking you've been buried. I mean, going back to the weed thing, I mean, like I say, I, I have caught quite a few fish fishing bottom baits and weed, but it's not always my first choice. But sometimes I think the fish tell you that's what you've got to be doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I have caught. I mean, but I will always put a, a bag on of either crush, crush boily, or sometimes even just a stringer. And it, it has, it has caught. Well, I mean, you know, when you were saying about people saying you have to use a barbless suit and that, and you can understand that from um, a logical point of view because it is going to fall off that easier. But I've never used a barbless suit and I have caught and, and weed with bottom baits quite a few times. Yeah, I and think, some, and some but... decent fish as well. Yeah, I, th- I think with, with regards to, um, how can I say, fishing a barb or souk so it doesn't snag on the silt weed. Yeah. If, uh, if there's like other types of weed in the lake taken aid of, then you're at the other end of the scale in terms of risking the fish coming off if it weeds you up. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Um, you know, so everything has to be taken into. Yeah, same I mean, in general, I'm not situation. much. For, I'm not much for barb or souks, but um, I think really. I mean, we're digressing a bit here, but I think really barbel suits are not too bad when the fish are big. I have noticed small fish can make a mess of the mouths of them. Yeah, I don't think I'd like to think of I know fish had weeded me up and they got a barbel suit on. No. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, do you think, I mean, like I say, I came up with this for Menzyme stuff. It was like 2018, 2017. No, 18 it was. Um, I mean, I use an enzyme in that. Um, I mean, do you think think that's think that mixture what you were using might benefit from putting an enzyme in it? So it's got. I mean, the, my my thinking behind it when I came up with it is, once I knew that this enzyme would work in lakes, lake pHs and lake temperatures, I just thought of it as a, a prolonged, controlled uh, release, if you like, because I knew it would work in situ, and I think I think that that might have a bit of mileage. I mean, it is a very similar thing that I came up with to what you were doing, slightly different, but it's not a million miles away. I think I think in regards to enzymes, you know, you know, uh, that's just the, the, an enzyme is either active or inactive, um, and they're governed by temperature and pH, and obviously water, because obviously for for yeah, say, it, can't, for example, it, can't, it can't react unless it's mobilised in a liquid. No, no. So, say, for say, say example, the human, the human body and the, and the human stomach. I think, without trying to sound like an anorak here, it's between 1.5 and 3.5 pH. And obviously the body, human body temperature is 37.5. Yeah, so but, all but the enzymes... I mean, but that's from, you know, that's from mammalian enzymes, though, but... I mean, when you're saying an enzyme is either active or it isn't, I mean, it is a bit of a grey area. I mean, the enzyme that I use will work between pH 3 and pH 9, and it'll work between any temperature between, I think it's about 10 degrees and 80 degrees. It even survived the cooking process and the boiling, but I'm not, I, I, you know, there's no proper control over that for me, so I, I've never oh, even gone down so, that route, you know. It sounds like the perfect enzyme. <clears throat> yeah, the, well, the it is. With- it is, and it's, it? it's a cysteine protease enzyme. So it's if you've done a bit so of research, what's in your body, isn't it? Then sorry, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an enzyme that's basically there's one of the same ones of the three that are in the human stomach. 
no, 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 because I mean they they don't work at the same pH or or temperature range. I mean, um, pepsin and trypsin. I think I think they're um, denatured above fifty degrees. Uh, this this isn't this isn't you know. All right. Um, I think as I'm long pre- as I think for the enzyme, well, for, with an en- with an enzyme. Now again, I'm not trying to be <laughs> an expert, more of an anora. Um, <clears throat> you need exo and endopeptidases to attack the receptor sites on the protein molecule, don't you? So you'd need to for efficient. Um, what you call it? No, no, you, you don't actually, John. No, <laughs> I mean we're getting a bit technical now, but um, yeah, no, I mean an exo and an endopept an endopeptidase is something that will cut cut a cut a protein up in the middle. An exopeptidase is one that will only cleave on the ends, and that's what happens. Yeah. That's what happens. Yeah, so, yeah you got short that, and long chain. Yeah, that's pep- what an exopeptidase is. What you need at your digestive interface. So a carp. I mean, everybody thinks everybody who knows a bit about a carp and how it digests food thinks they just uses trypsin and chymotrypsin. Well, it does, but they are. But then at the actual digestive interface, it uses. Uh, carboxypeptidases, because otherwise it yeah. won't get chopped up into the single amino acids. But, I mean, we're yeah. digressing a little bit as well. But, um, but yeah, I mean, this enzyme that I, that I use, I'm, I'm, I know that there is people who are using it who are making enzyme boilies. Uh, and it does work to a degree, but I can't ever see the logic in doing that when I can use a liquid or CPSP90 or, or whatever to achieve the same thing without having mess around with an enzyme. Because, I mean, the, the lads who I know who are using similar sort of enzymes, they reckon that when they get it right, they're getting a boilie that's very, very soft and the scent is like a cream egg. Well, to me, that's not really a boilie because I can't, I can't use a throwing stick with it or anything. So, you know, I, I've never gone down the route of enzymes in boilies because I can't see, I can't see the benefit in it um, at all. Oh yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head. If you've got uh, products like, um, you know, hydrolyzed casein, yeah. CPSP ninety, yeah, you know, they, they they to me cover the whole spectrum. Exactly, what you're trying to achieve. Exactly, but but with the with the with the mindset that I've got with this for enzyme product, I thought to myself, if I can create something that I can have sitting in situ, and the attraction of it is increasing the longer it's out there. Then I'm doing something that can't be achieved. Any so other way. is this is this for an enzyme from from, en, from enzyme put in the boilie when it's been manufactured or is it put on the outside? No, no, no. The from enzyme. I mean, you bought some off me. No, it's yeah, it's, no, it's, I mean, it's an additive. Using, it's an yeah, additive. I'm, I was thinking of your ideal way of using it. That was all. Oh no, no, no! It's definitely not for adding to boilies at all. It's it's for making stick mixes, bags. Um, I mean, some of the lads have used it to create a sort of a hook bait out of it because you can actually get it um, to make a, a crust on on a, on a hook bait. Like you can get an odd hook bait or a wafter or whatever, uh, and if you apply a little bit of liquid to it and then add the powder to it and then keep dry and get it dry enough so that the enzyme isn't mobilized properly, you can make quite a hard skin, and it'll last yeah. for a long time. So you've got that prolonged release. And some of them, I mean, I don't, I have done it and I've caught on them. Uh, but the lads who, who use it a lot say that they can chuck them out, and the coating's only just only just fully breaking down after like ten hours, you know. So they so they gain a good long prolonged release of attraction there, um, yeah. you know. And other lads have had it off me, and they've made paste up with it and stuff, and you said the paste degrading within a few hours if they leave it in the in the windowsill. So I know hundred percent that the enzyme and it is actually working. It does work. Right. I'll have to uh, I'll have to dig that to uh, from enzyme out of both. Yeah, well, I mean, if you're gonna yeah. if you're gonna use it, John, I'd just use it the same way as you've been making your own bags up and the method that you yeah. spoke about, and just see how you get on with it. Yeah, yeah, you um, know, because it's a it's a very similar animal. It's a very similar thing, but there is a spice extract in that from enzyme as well. There is a spice extract in it. Right. Uh, is that what? What? Um, without going into what it is, is it um, a, a Robin Red esque? No, type. no, 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 no. It it isn't. Uh, it isn't uh, a pepper one. No, 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 no. no. Right. Um, it's uh, it's it's another spice that I think is very effective. But yeah. So 
Yeah, I mean, I think we've I think we've about covered things there, don't you, John? Yes, mate. I think we have um, from the mandate. Yes, mate. Uh, not unless you want to talk about something else. Yeah, I mean, if there's anything, if there's anything you'd like to speak about now, just just before I wrap the meeting up, by all means, feel free. What do you think about? Say, if you jump back twenty five years, when the majority of carp anglers were making their own bait, compared to. You know, in terms of quality, attraction, etc., compared to modern day mass produced on machines, we won't go into any big makes, we won't name anybody. What do you think is of that in comparison? Well, I mean, you have various things about people saying certain things won't go through machines, but I'll be honest with you, I've owned two different types of two, two, two different manufacturers' boiler machines, and I'm not making bait on a massive scale. I mean, I sell a few ton a year. Uh, because I do it for a living, but I haven't found any of my mixes that won't go through a machine yet. Some are better than others, but they will go through. And I don't grind everything down either, which I know some people do, but I don't. And there's plenty of there's plenty of bits in in my base mixes, nearly all of them. I mean, I do even sell a bird food, which is pretty coarse. Um, but with regards to the quality of bait now compared to the quality of bait then. I think it's just the age old adage that there was some good stuff then and there's some good stuff now and there's some bad stuff then and some bad stuff now, you know. Yeah. I mean when I used to make bait, and this is like from proprietary base mixes, I'd always try and boil it at the least time possible. Oh yeah, I mean that that's yeah. that's the that's the directive from day one for me ever since I've made bait. I've always preferred a soft bait and I've always kept the cook times as low as possible. And that's why I'm a massive fan of using the refined milk proteins because they are some of the best ingredients for keeping your cook times down. I mean, I know you've spoke to me about egg albumin, uh, and I do use that in our duke baits, but I, I aren't much for it in free offerings, although I do sell two baits with it in. I'm not much for it in free offerings because I don't like how it, how it skins the bait up too much, and I think it, I definitely think it's got a bearing on um, attract and release. I don't, I'm, not yeah. much for it. I'm not much for it in free offerings. Duke baits, yeah, but because it's it's necessary for the uke baits because you've got to make them impervious to small fish. But I'm not much for it in free offerings, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we spoke about this on on the podcast. We are on the phone. But remember when I was telling you about when I was making actual mainline activate? Yeah. Um. Obviously, I wanted it in 16 mil, so I was getting the bait mix from mainline. Um, adding more liquids. Uh, well, the activator, I was adding uh, 100 mil per kilo. I think it was 20 mil per six egg was the recommended dose. Re recommended yeah. dose. And then I was adding one ounce of egg albumin per kilo. And basically, what I wanted to do there, the, I wanted to be able to fire the baits out of a catapult um, without them, um, you know, because the, 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 having the weight, obviously a, a, a 16 mil goes out further than a, than a 15, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so that was the advantage, and also what I wanted to do is have have control over the boiling time because yeah. I boiled them for just over a minute, yeah, and then I let them dry out for say twenty four hours, and then I glugged them again and activated, yeah, and I had some absolutely amazing results on that. It was a good, it was a good bait. That it was, um, yeah. it was caramine. Wanted to caramine and activate. That was one of the key components to that bait. Caramine, the meat, the meat derivative. Yeah, yeah. So I believe, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, it like, was. If, if, if anyone's old enough to be able to smell the Activate, you should have all, a various sort of array of smells. When Boil, come boiled out. and flavour it was in that bait, John. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was boiled down. It was boiled down. Yeah, yeah. So anyway then, I'll, uh, I'll thank you very much for coming on. And I think quite a lot of people are going to take quite a bit from this this podcast. Um, because you know there's some good edges you give away there about what you were doing with these bags, uh, and it yeah. might even sell me a few pots of this for man's arm as well. You never know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and, and the captures that you had. I mean, I know I know you're a bit modest, but they were. I think personally that they were phenomenal, really, for the time of the year and the area of the country. You know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll just thank you for coming on, John. And if this it's goes been down a pleasure. Well, if this goes down well, mate, I'll I'll get you back on again because I know you've got plenty to talk about in regards to fishing. 
So yeah, okay then, yeah, it'll be a pleasure, mate. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We'll just see how it goes. Thanks a lot for coming All on, right. John. Right, cheers, Dean. Thank Bye, you very mate. much. Bye. Bye, mate. Bye.